Hey, I'm Callie. I'm almost 16, but I could live in peace only in the first two years of my child's life. Until my little brother, Ethan, came along and ruined everything. I always hoped that that little brat had never been born. And if you're the oldest sibling like I am, then chances are you'll feel the same way as I do. Firstly, his birth meant that my parents barely noticed me anymore. Yeah, I know I was two back then, so I don't actually remember this, but as the years passed by, I saw how it was. I got into trouble for dumb things because I was the oldest, while Ethan got away with everything because he was too young to understand. Ugh, I really hate my brother. And I could tell tons of reasons for that. We always fought over the last slice of pizza. When he got it, he'd eat it open-mouthed in front of me. And mom would smile and say, Ah, my growing boy. But when I got it, mom would frown at me and say, Callie, don't be greedy. Ugh! He'd sneak into my room and took the plushy bunny my bestie gave me and superglued its ears together. So I took his switch and hid it in the basement. It took him an entire week to find it. Ha! <laughs> in revenge, he smeared chocolate over the back of my pants. I only realized what was going on when other kids started laughing and pointing at me. I had to wear my sweater tied around my waist for the rest of the day, even though it was freezing. So... I retaliated by rubbing stinging nettles on his pillow. The next morning, his face was bright red and he couldn't stop itching. It was so funny. It was also a photo shoot day. So much to his protests, a makeup artist spent ages applying makeup on him to cover up the redness. He looked so ridiculous. <laughs> you see, my dad's a politician, so sometimes we have to appear in photo shoots where we look like a loving, harmonious family. Pfft, as if. I could play pretend for the cameras, but in reality, I really just wanted to kick my brother's butt. We just didn't get on at all. He's such a brat. So I guess pranking each other was our coping strategy. I mean, hey, it isn't easy living with someone you hate. Our pranks happen so often that our parents just let us get on with it. However, there is one thing Ethan is terrified of. It all started back when he was eight, and Dad was watching The Walking Dead. Me and Ethan walked into the room, just as there was a zoom-in scene in which a zombie was having a feeding frenzy. Being the brave girl, I thought it was interesting and sat down and watched it with Dad. But my bro, being the wuss, he screamed, then ran out of the room, hid under our parents' bed, burst into tears, and refused to move for two hours because he was convinced that at the sight of that zombie, he knew he must be chosen, and zombies were going out to get him. Gotta Achilles' heel. So, not long after that, when he dropped my brand new headphones down the toilet, which made me have to put my hand in to pick it up, I decided to get revenge on him. And luckily for me, Halloween was just around the corner. Perfect. I binge-watched makeup tutorials on YouTube and practiced on my friends. Then on Halloween, I turned myself into a seriously scary zombie, hid the video camera in his room, got into his closet, and made grumbling and moaning sounds. When he opened the closet door, I jumped out at him and tackled him to the floor. OMG, he screamed so loudly and he actually peed his pants. And now, all these years later, I still have it on video to torment him with. Ha! But don't be fooled, as my brother was not your average kitty. It wasn't that long ago that he played a prank on me, which made me madder than Misty from Pokemon. So, I had a crush on this boy from school. He was just so sweet and dreamy, and from the cute glances he kept on giving me, I was 100% sure he liked me too. Valentine's Day seemed like the perfect day to express my feelings toward him, so I stayed up until midnight the night before making chocolate for him. I left my chocolates lovingly wrapped and boxed on the side in the kitchen and went to bed. The next day, I grabbed the box and at lunchtime, I handed it to my crush. To my utter dismay when he opened it, Instead of the lovely heart-shaped chocolates I'd spent hours making, there were embarrassing childhood pics of me, including a photo from when I was 12 with a bunch of hideous pimples on my face. One of me as a toddler sleeping with my mouth open and saliva drool on my chin, and one of me as a baby with a bowl of food mush on my head. Then my crush lifted up a note saying, Great chocolate, sis. That sneaky brat. Although my crush kept saying that I looked really cute in those photos and he liked them even more than chocolates, I still wanted to give that brat a hard punch right in his annoying face. 
Oh, God, I'm begging you, please take him away from me. I'll be good. I'll do my homework on time, and I'll stop borrowing Mom's expensive perfume. Okay, so this may have been my wish, but I never expected that it would come true. It was a normal evening around the dinner table. Ethan was glued to his phone, and Mom got really annoyed and made him clear up the table. While he was doing that, I saw a message pop up on his phone from someone called Sophie, saying, Okay, I'll see you in the front of the cinema at 8 p.m. I'm looking forward to it, smiley face. What? Ethan had a date? Oh, my sweet little bro. It was payback time for ruining my crush's chocolates. So I stealthily followed Ethan to the cinema. Because the cinema was pretty close to our home, we both walked. He cut through the park. Jeez, it was creepy at this time. I swear the trees looked like monsters. Anyway, I saw something light up by my feet. I picked it up. It was Ethan's phone. What an idiot. I was so going to make him work hard to get this back. As I walked out of the park, I saw a black van parked nearby. Suddenly, I heard a scream and saw two giant men trying to drag Ethan toward the back of the van. Ethan was crying and struggling with fierce resistance, but my weak, skinny 14-year-old brother was no rival for those two men. What? How dare they try and kidnap my brother? He might have been the most annoying human on the planet, but he was my annoying little brother. There's no way I was letting this happen. I rushed forward and shouted, Ethan, zombie mode on! My presence startled the two kidnappers, and this made them more intent on dragging him toward the van. When all of a sudden, Ethan bit down hard into the hand of the man who was covering his mouth, just like how zombies always do. Good one, bro. The man wept out and shook his hand. The other man pulled on Ethan's arm, but he managed to scramble to his feet. As the man tried to push him into the van, Ethan sought his opportunity and kicked him right between his legs. Ouch. While this was going on, I called the cops and told them to be quick. Then I saw the jerk with the bitten hand about to grab Ethan again. So I screamed out loud, Ethan, run! He sprinted off into the park and the bitten man followed him. It was exactly a real-life zombie chase. Huh. Suddenly, I felt arms grab me around the waist. Oh no, it was the other guy. He said, I guess you'll have to go too. Before he lifted me up and carried me over to the back of the van. I screamed out and tried hitting and kicking out, but he was too strong. He threw me into the back of the van before he could get in. I smashed the van door and quickly locked the door from the inside to knock him out. Lucky for me, not him, but the guy chasing Ethan was the one who was keeping the key. It was so scary when the kidnapper kept shouting at me outside, but I was even more frightened thinking Ethan could get hurt somewhere out there. Then suddenly I heard his voice. Hey, stop. Did he get caught? I looked out to see the contrary. He was running towards me after two police officials. They were holding their guns to control the guy standing by the van. Ethan was safe and came back for me. I opened the door and jumped into his arms. Oh, let's skip this part. I get goosebumps every time I recall this weepy situation. Me and Ethan followed the cops and saw the other kidnapper handcuffed to a tree, fighting with mosquitoes with his one free arm in the dark. The police told me that during the way heading to the van, Ethan kept on complaining about how slow and unprofessional they were, as they should come to save me first instead. My boy still stubbornly said, I could run myself, but this wimp couldn't. The idiot definitely couldn't have imagined that he has a Wonder Woman big sister like me. <laughs> Our parents rushed into the police department to see us. And yep, weepy part again. Turned out my dad's rival had hired the guy to kidnap Ethan so that they could use him to blackmail my dad. I don't clearly understand the whole situation. Maybe after this I'll watch more political movies. But now, thanks God, we're safe. I may have wished my brother would disappear, but when I actually could have lost him forever, well, I have to admit that it really freaked me out. And it turns out he felt the same way about me too. Crazy, huh? Of course, we still play pranks on each other. We wouldn't be us if we didn't. But I realized something. He might be the most annoying brat ever, but he's still my family. And I love my family so much. However, I'm pretty sure there'll still be times when I hate my annoying little bro. Like right now, while I'm sitting in my room telling you my story, I'm sure I can hear him giggling outside of my door. What's the betting I open it and end up with a bucket of cold water on my head or something? All this may because I have told my mom he has a girlfriend. Tough luck, little bro. There's no way you're getting the better of this pranking queen.
I'm so excited as it's my graduation ceremony tomorrow. Eek! And today I'm on my way to the airport to pick my mom up. I can't wait to see her, but, well, ugh, it's complicated. I grew up in Philly, but I've been studying here in Toronto for the last three years. I'm so grateful to God for letting me be a girl because, you know, girls' lives are way more colorful than boys' lives are. Clothes, makeup, shoes, you name it. For girls, it's just so much more fun. I understand I'm probably confusing you. Well, up until the age of 18, I lived life as a boy. Kai. Actually, Kai is my legal name. I grew up with toy trucks, dinosaur wallpaper, and a rocket-shaped playhouse. Then, at two years old, Mom moved into a villa out in the countryside. It was just us and our old maid, Rita. Meanwhile, my father and grandparents stayed in the city and ran the family company together. Back then, all I knew was my family was rich and successful, but I didn't think much about it. Hey, I was just a kid. All I cared about was getting to choose what color tumbler I had my juice in. Mom always said we moved away because of her migraines, which worsened in hectic surroundings. Nonsense. She just wanted to keep me away from the family so they wouldn't figure out I was actually a girl. Crazy, huh? So I must have known I was a girl, right? The thing is, when you're little, you pretty much believe everything your mom tells you. So when she said I was a boy, then I had no reason to think otherwise. Still, I was drawn to girly things like a magpie was to anything shiny. For instance, I tried putting my mom's sparkly hair clips in my short hair, but mom caught me, took them out, and told me they weren't for boys. Another time, when I was at a play date at this boy's house, I peered into his sister's room and saw all of the Barbies and dolls. Mesmerized, I took one and started playing with it, but then I heard him laughing at me, and he teased me that I was a boy and I shouldn't like gross things like dollies. I didn't like being teased, so after that, I tried to keep my liking for girly stuff to myself. I pretended to like action figures, aliens, and cars. But to be honest, I didn't care much for them at all. But the older I got, the harder it was for my mom to keep up the lie. The trickiest part being the school restrooms. To hide the secret, mom told me the bathrooms at school were dirty, and if I used them, I'd end up with scaly green skin. So every day on the break, Rita would come and take me home to go to the toilet. At first, people at school thought this was weird, but then I guess they just put it down to odd things that rich people do. The other boys annoyed me. I didn't want to play football or run around the playground pretending to be a gladiator. Instead, I wanted to hula hoop with the girls and plait the manes of their toy ponies. So I did just that. One time, when I was waiting to get picked up from school, me and my friend were flicking through her girly magazine. Then suddenly, Mom stormed up to me and dragged me out of the girl zone. Then on the ride home, in a serious voice, she said, Kai, boys have to play with boys. It's just the way it is. This sucked, as I didn't want to play with the boys, but I didn't want to upset my mom, so I stopped playing with the girls. From then onward, I mostly just sat by myself and read fairy tales about princesses and mermaids, which I disguised in the covers of boys' books. My mom must have realized how I felt, so she didn't want to risk me being around other girls which is why, at 11, she insisted I went to an all-boys school. That sucked, as I had never really gotten along with other boys, if not to say that I hated them. But then, during lunch on my first day at the new school, this boy called Kevin sat down next to me and passed me half of his candy bar. We became best friends after that, and even built a den together in the nearby woods. Hanging out with him were my happiest days, as in those moments I just felt free. Then one day during a biology class, the teacher passed us sheets with diagrams of boys' bodies. Huh. My body didn't look like that. Was there something wrong with me? Confused, I decided to confide in Kevin about this. He was also a boy, so he could help me, right? I held up the sheet and whispered to him, Um, my body is different to this. Before Kevin even had a chance to answer, one of the other boys shouted out, Kai's different from us. Let's go check it out. Then, to my horror, some of them lifted me and started carrying me toward the bathroom. I was screaming at the top of my voice. Luckily, the teacher ran out into the hallway after me and demanded the boys put me down at once. 
My mom rushed to school ASAP to take me home as she received a call from my teacher about the incident. She tried cheering me up with ice cream, but it didn't work. I was so upset and confused. Mom, why am I different from other boys? She gave a wounded look, sighed, then in a quiet voice said, Before I tell you the truth, I need you to understand that I love you, Kai, and everything I do is to protect you. She hugged me close to her, then continued, I was so desperate for a child, but after years of trying, it felt like it wasn't meant to be. Then I found out that your dad cheated on me with another woman, and she was pregnant with a boy. I stared at Mom with wide eyes, patiently waiting to hear what came next, because so far, nothing made sense. This was hard to bear, but just when I thought my heart would break, well, I fell pregnant with you. You have to understand, your father and grandparents have very old-fashioned mindsets on the company and having a male heir to inherit it. So, even though his mistress ended up having a baby girl, and your father agreed to fund them both only if they moved to Miami, I knew you'd never be respected in your father's eyes, not as a girl. That mistress of his would make sure their daughter came back and got everything over you. I just couldn't let that happen. So I lied to everyone that you were a boy. I know you're probably angry with me and I don't blame you, but you can't tell your father the truth. You can't tell anyone the truth. Wow. So I was a girl? Now everything started to fall into place. This explained a lot, but of course I was furious. I'd been forced to live a lie just to please my mom. It took a few days before I began to calm down and be more understanding. I guess things must have been really hard for her, too. Also, I was kind of relieved I was actually a girl, as deep down I'd always felt a desire to wear pretty dresses and play with dolls. I told Mom this and said I loved being a girl, so she made a compromise with me. I'd continue living as Kai until I was 18, then I would go and study abroad as the girl I'd always dreamed of being. After that, I moved schools to keep up the secret. It sucked that I didn't get a chance to say goodbye to Kevin, but I was relieved to go to a co-ed school again. Mom said I could hang out with the other girls as long as I kept the secret. Then, when I started high school, things became more complicated. Firstly, my voice was naturally soft, so I had to put on this gruff voice which would leave me with a sore throat by the end of the day. So I just became one of those kids who didn't say much. I had to spend ages each morning wrapping a bandage around my chest to flatten it, and then I hid beneath baggy t-shirts and sweaters. I also had to do this boy walk. Then there was the bathroom. I swear everyone thought I had bladder problems, as I was the kid who always asked to go to the bathroom mid-class to avoid the other boys. At least there's one good thing out of this was that I didn't have to deal with sweaty P.E., as mom had told the principal that I had a health problem so I could stay out of these risky activities, especially swimming lessons. But the struggles would never stop. I often looked at the girls with their glossy lips and in their cute vest tops with envy. Oh, how I longed to be able to be who I wanted to be. Finally, high school finished, and true to her word, mom sent me off to a college in Canada. She sorted all of the paperwork out for me. There, I changed my name to Leanna, and I started my new, exciting life as a girl. I love long, shiny mermaid hair, so I started wearing a wig. I watched so many YouTube videos on how to apply makeup, painted my nails, wore pretty outfits, and tried walking in heels. Um, okay, all of these things would take some practice, but it still felt amazing. I was finally free of my old fake life, and I could just be me. But I knew my family couldn't find out the truth as it could have catastrophic effects for me and my mom. So I still had to dress and act like Kai again whenever I FaceTimed Dad or my grandparents. Ugh. Time sure flies when you're having fun, doesn't it? I couldn't believe I was graduating tomorrow, and I was so grateful that Mom would be here to see it. When I picked her up from the airport, we both hugged and cried, then hugged some more. Through sobs, she blurted out, Look at you! You look so... different. Thanks, Mom. I smiled and wiped her tears away. Luckily, Dad's workaholic, so he didn't even ask to come. Phew, as that would have been an awkward situation. As I wheeled Mom's suitcase out of the airport, she said to me, We just need to take some photos of you graduating as Kai to show the rest of the family. 
I didn't want to be Kai on my special day, but I knew it was something that had to be done. So I forced a smile and said, Sure, Mom, but let's do it where no one else can see us. I don't want my friends thinking I've gone crazy. The graduation ceremony was awesome. It felt so good to be up on that stage collecting my degree as my true self, glossy hair and all. Afterward, I took Mom to my favorite restaurant to continue the celebrations. As I twirled a piece of pasta around my fork, I said to her, It feels so good to live life as a girl. I was thinking, I want to go back to Philadelphia and tell everyone the truth about who I am. My mom's face dropped, and then she said something totally unexpected. I was swaying to the music with the hottest girl at school in my arms. Everything was perfect when suddenly I saw a flurry of red storming toward me and then the next thing I knew, I was being slapped across the face. Ugh, it was my ex, Rosie. She was looking at me as if she wanted to snap me in half. Okay, so Rosie and me had only broken up yesterday. But that didn't mean she had the right to go full psycho on me. Hey, so I'm Andrew and I like to think I'm a pretty smart guy. The problem is, I'm a sucker for hot girls. I tend to be blinded by their beauty. The result being, I don't always make the best decisions around them. But I had no idea what drama my weakness for a pretty girl was about to get me into. So it all began with the end-of-term college party. Me and my friends went heavy on the drinks. So when my friend Brad bet me a burger that I wouldn't go and ask Lisa to dance, well, I didn't hesitate in approaching her. Jeez, she's so hot and way out of my league. So I was expecting her to tell me to go away, but instead she smiled and let me lead her over to the dance floor. While we were dancing, she whispered in my ear that she'd always like me. Then, yup, you guessed it, Rosie, my crazy ex, stormed over and slapped me. I woke up the next morning with a pounding headache. Ugh, what was all that shouting coming from outside my open window? I wrapped my bed cover around me and shuffled my way over there to take a look. Huh, Lisa and Rosie were yelling at each other. He's mine, not yours. Stay away. He wants me, not you. Deal with it. Oh yeah? Well, maybe we should ask Andrew who he prefers. What's the point? As we both know, he'll pick me. I was far too hungover for this, so I closed the window and went back to bed. These girls, uh, they wouldn't stop. For the next few days, they bombarded me with messages and waited for me outside my house. Okay, so most guys dream of two hot girls fighting over them, but trust me, watching them pull each other's hair extensions out isn't as glamorous as it sounds. Thankfully, my prayers were answered by none other than Richie, my awesome brother. He showed up with a ticket for a luxury two-week cruise trip. He'd booked it ages ago, but then a work thing came up, so the ticket was all mine. Hell yeah! I hugged my brother, grabbed the ticket out of his hand, and started packing. The tricky part was sneaking past Rosie and Lisa who were still lingering about outside. So I borrowed my housemate's hoodie and baseball cap and pretended to be him to get past them. Result? They didn't even double look at me. Goodbye to my Lisa and Rosie nightmare and hello to the vacation of my dreams. Ah, this is the life. Trust my brother to book such a lavish place. My room was huge and it had my very own balcony. There was so much to do here, from the outdoor bar, dozens of restaurants, swimming pool, cinema... I was on my own floating complex. Heaven. The next morning when I woke up in my king-size bed, I took in the sounds of silence. Yep. Oh, sweet silence, how I've missed you. This was a no-girl arguing zone. (laughs) I got changed and walked over to the outdoor bar. It definitely wasn't too early for a cocktail. I had a pair of shades on, and that's when I spotted her. Whoa, she was beautiful. I quickly ordered two cocktails and began walking toward her. I was about to hand her the drink when I tripped over a sun lounger, and in slow motion, I watched the cup fall. I desperately tried to grab it, but nope. Instead, I managed to knock into her back. She let out a yelp and then yelled out, You pervert! What do you think you're playing at? I stood there open-mouthed, contemplating if I should dive into the pool to escape this drama or not. Then I looked down at my sunglasses, which in all the action had fallen off. Suddenly, an idea came to me. So I bent down, stretched out my arms, and pretended to fumble around for them. She looked at me for a while, then picked my sunglasses up, placed them in my hand, then said, Oh, I'm sorry, I I didn't realize. Here, let me help you. Then she took my arm and guided me across the pool area. I thanked her. And then, with my trusty shades on, I watched her walk away. So she thought I was blind. Yep, this wasn't my greatest idea. 
but it got me out of a sticky situation with a hot girl at least. Later that night, I went to the buffet restaurant for dinner. I was stacking my plate when I bumped straight into someone and almost dropped my plate. Ugh, it was that hot girl again. I quickly put my shades on, then deliberately turned the wrong way and loudly said, Oh, I'm sorry. She put her hand on my shoulder and guided me so I was facing her, then said, yeah, It's me, the girl from the pool. And it's okay, I should have been looking where I was going. Um, do you need any help? I quickly cut her off. No thanks, it's okay. Then I lifted my plate up to my nose and sniffed it. Mmm, these prawns sure smell good. She raised an eyebrow at my food-smelling talent. So I carried on pretending to sniff the food as I put it on my plate. And you know what? She wouldn't quit staring at me. Eventually, she walked off. Phew, what a narrow escape. Afterward, I went to the top deck bar to chill out. With yet another cocktail. Then who should walk over but, yup, you guessed it, the hot girl. I immediately looked away from her, but what's this? She walked over to me and sat down opposite me. Hey, do you remember me? She asked. Seeing my chance to flirt with her, I replied. Oh, yes, how could I forget someone as beautiful as you are? Huh? How do you know that I'm beautiful? Damn it, I needed to think before I spoke. Ah, well, it's your voice. A sweet voice like yours can only belong to a beautiful girl. Crisis averted. As after that, we started chatting and oh boy, oh boy, she's a sweetheart. Do you know that she's an activist for an organization that works hard to guarantee the rights of baby girls born in Africa? I know, amazing. The evening came to an end and she said, Oh, my name's Bella, by the way. I replied, Bella, a name as beautiful as your soul. Mine's Andrew. She gave me a nervous giggle. Well, Andrew, <laughs> it's getting late, so I suppose I better get back to my cabin. I didn't want the night to ever end, so I blurted out, Whoa, Bella, look at the sky. Isn't it so stunning? She glared at me and then replied, How would you know that? Oops, of course, I was meant to be blind. Um, uh, I can feel it from the breeze. She gave me a quizzing look, then said, Right, well, good night. How about we meet at the arcade tomorrow, let's say 10 a.m.? I excitedly agreed, then she left. Another close escape. I really needed to be more careful. Bella, Bella, Bella. I couldn't stop thinking of her. The next day, I'm such a kid when it comes to arcades, I can't help it. My inner child comes out and, ooh, a car racing game. Nope, I was pretending to be blind. So I awkwardly lingered in the foyer and waited for Bella to show up. When she did, she took my arm and guided me through the arcade. She described all the different games machines to me, which I thought was really sweet. Then she led me over to the plushy grabber machine and squealed excitedly. Hoo-hoo, I loved these as a kid! Soon, I was fumbling about to slot my money in, adamant I was going to win her a plushie. But wait, uh, I was meant to be blind. So I touched the controls, then closed my eyes. Her laughter said it all. Massive fail. It was all going to be okay, until Bella had to use the restroom and instructed me to stay put and wait for her by a shooting game machine, which so happened to be my all-time favorite arcade game. I rushed over to it as soon as she was out of sight, grabbed a gun, and shot five cans in a row. Then I jumped up and down and whooped in the air. I turned around and saw Bella frowning at me. Oh boy, busted. I tried to explain, but she just shook her head and said, How could you? You're a coward, a pervert, and a liar. Then she ran off. I felt terrible. I tried searching the ship for her, but I couldn't find her anywhere. Feeling bummed out, I ordered a cocktail, then went for a walk across the deck. Suddenly, I heard shouting coming from below me. Huh? What was that? I peered down and saw a man and a woman trying to drag a little girl into one of the safety rafts. Hang on, they weren't alone. Bella was there too. She was trying to pull the little girl away from them. Without even thinking, I dropped my drink and ran over to them. I charged towards the woman and knocked her so hard she almost fell into the sea. The man reached out to steady her, which gave Bella a chance to pick up the kid then she grabbed my arm and pulled me away. After that, the bad guys jumped into the raft and sailed away. We returned the girl to her parents. It turns out Bella was on her way to her cabin when she saw a couple in tears as they couldn't find their daughter. So she went looking for her and walked in on the kidnapping. After that, Bella forgave me. Well, I did save the day and all. And we spent the rest of the trip together. Then on our last day, I got down on one knee and asked her to be my girlfriend. And she said yes. I took her back home with me, and as we walked over to my house, Lisa and Rosie ran towards me and started arguing with each other about who I liked more. Oh shoot, I'd forgotten about them. Reading the situation, Bella approached them. Thank God you're here. I assume one of you is his girlfriend, right? There was an accident, and Andrew's blind now, and he really needs someone by his side 24-7. Hearing that, I quickly coordinated with her by waving my arms wildly about. So, which one is your girlfriend, Andy? Uh, it's Lisa! 
Rosie quickly chimed in. No, uh, he's all yours. We only hung out once. Ha, what suckers. I watched them run away. Then Bella and I burst out laughing. After that, I held my arm out to her and let her guide me home. You know, for old time's sake. Lying to her about being blind was a jerky thing to do. But I only did it in the first place because being around beautiful girls makes me so nervous I do dumb stuff. It's just lucky that Bella forgave me because I think this dumbass may have found his dream girl. It was a regular morning, and I was sorting my books out in my locker when excited screams and cheers distracted me. Huh? It was way too early for this level of noise. A group of girls was lingering around the bulletin board. I walked over to take a look. Turns out, it was just the latest poster of Hillary, the prettiest girl in school, for her campaign of becoming prom queen. <sighs> well, yeah. Typical reaction since Hillary alone is too perfect already. All day, I found myself thinking about the Queen Hillary poster. Oh, I wish I could be as beautiful as she is. I mean, I'm not that ugly, but damn sure I'm not beautiful like her. OMG, look at me. My cheekbones aren't defined enough. My lips aren't pumped enough. My hair is too frizzy and I literally have to jump on the spot to get myself into my favorite pair of jeans. Ugh, let's face it, I was plain and ordinary, while Hillary, she was oh so beautiful. Mom called me down for dinner, so I sat there glumly twirling my fork around my plate. Mom must have noticed something was up, as frowning she asked me, Sonia, what's wrong? You've barely touched your dinner. I'm not hungry. I sighed out. Anyways, I'm big enough already. And ugly enough. Sweetie, don't be silly. You look lovely. Yeah, right. Mom was only saying that because she felt like she had to. I thanked her for dinner, then went back to my room and scrolled through Hillary's profile. There wasn't one bad picture of her. Not one! She was so flawless. While I was, well, full of flaws. The next day, I was hanging out on the school field with my best friend Sydney and my boyfriend Lucas when Hillary passed by in a stunning dress. Jeez, look how gorgeous she was. Earth to Sonia. Sydney threw a potato chip at me. I turned and gave her a what was that for look. She rolled her eyes and continued. Stop staring at little Miss Popular and pay attention to us. You know, your actual friends. Hello? Sorry, I sighed. It's just that she looks so pretty in that dress. It's not fair. She doesn't even have to try. Well, on me, it'd look like I was wearing a garbage bag. Stop comparing yourself to her. It's dumb. Yeah, Hillary's Hillary. You are you. And you have your own beauty. I shook my head. Yeah, right. I didn't have any beauty. Instead, I was ordinary, while Hillary was extraordinary. Chemistry was the only class I shared with Hillary, and for that entire 45 minutes, I just couldn't stop staring over at her, transfixed. As the teacher droned on about the periodic table, I daydreamed about how amazing it would be to have hair as glossy, skin as clear as hers. I caught her staring back at me a couple of times, and one time she mouthed, What? then rolled her eyes and annoyedly turned away. But still, I couldn't take my eyes off of her. After the lesson, I followed her to her next class, even though it was in a different direction to where I needed to be. I watched on with envy as her boyfriend, Ethan, the captain of the basketball team, looked at her adoringly, and how her pretty friends flocked around her. It must be so awesome to be that perfect. My Hillary obsession continued at home. Each evening, I scrolled through her profile and saved any new pics she'd posted. Then I'd just lay in bed staring at her perfect features and comparing them to my not-so-perfect ones. I even printed out my fave pics of her and framed them on my desk. <sighs> then one day, my worst nightmare came true. I was on my way to meet Lucas when I saw him standing in the hallway 
and talking to Hillary. That's odd. A popular girl like Hillary would never enjoy talking to a normie like him. Oh man, look how Lucas keeps laughing then giggling. What if Hillary likes him? That kind of girl definitely gets whatever she wants easily. I couldn't watch any more of this, so I sent Sydney an emergency message and rushed off to the bathroom. She found me crying in the cubicle and asked me what was wrong. I told her what had happened and she frowned. Are you insane? Lucas was probably just being polite to her. Jeez, he's with you for a reason, so get over this Hillary fixation. It's weird. Why did Sydney have to be so rude? I wanted her support, not her backlash. So I didn't meet up with her after school as planned. Instead, I went straight home and looked through my Hillary photos. I cut out sections of her lips, nose, hair, and stuck them on top of a photo of me. Looking down at it, well, wow, I looked so much better. It was then that I decided I would have a perfect face like her. So clutching the improved photo, I hurried down to my mom and waved it in her face. Look how perfect I'd be if I changed a few things. Please will you lend me the money to pay for surgery? Please? Mom looked horrified. Sonia, you're only 17, and you're already beautiful. You don't need to put yourself through all this pain and risks to look like someone else. I tried explaining to her that I didn't want to continue my life looking as plain and boring as I did, but she didn't listen at first. It took me a lot of time to talk her through, and let's face it, she also has had a nose job before. So what's the big deal about me getting mine fixed too, along with a few more touch-ups? That summer, I lied to Sydney and Lucas that I was spending the whole holiday with my dad and stepmom. I showed the surgeon a photo of Hillary as an example of the results I wanted. So he narrowed my nose, inserted cheek implants to give me a more defined look, and injected my lips with filler. I woke up after surgery in agony. Oh dear God, it hurts! I couldn't talk, and even crying was painful. Worse still, with all the bandages, I resembled an Egyptian mummy. Then, when the bandages were removed, my face was all swollen and puffy, and I had to do these massages to improve my facial muscles again. Pain is beauty, and beauty is pain, isn't it? Mum wasn't exactly impressed with what I did, as I didn't really tell her I would change my entire face. Still, she spent the summer looking after me, even though I did have to put up with her whining and sometimes even tears. Once healed, all that was left to do was have my hair colored and cut like Hillary's, and change my style to match hers. With my new look complete, I looked at the mirror and smiled. Finally, I was beautiful. I returned to school excited for everyone to see my new look, but as I walked through the hallway, everyone stared and gossiped about me. People I didn't know surrounded me and bombarded me with questions such as, which parts did you fix? How much? And did it hurt? Nobody actually complimented me or anything. Then, as I was sorting out my locker, I heard a cough. I looked up to see Sydney standing there with her arms folded. So, was it worth it? I wasn't in the mood for this, so I replied, You can't say anything nice, can you? This is who I am now. I'm being my true self. And I'm happy. No. This is you trying to be someone you're not. I slammed my locker shut and stormed off. What kind of person doesn't support her own best friend? My day went from bad to worse when I met Lucas at lunch. He glared at me, then angrily said, Sonia, why? There was nothing wrong with you before, but now you're just a clone of someone else. He went to leave, but I held his arm. Please! I did this because I want to be more beautiful. For you. I did this for you. Lucas shook his head, then gave a thoughtful sigh. He didn't try to leave after that, but he kept giving me this pitying look. Then, when I was walking to class, a guy ran up behind me and put his arm around my waist. Hi there, my baby. Startled, I immediately pushed him away. Oh, it was Ethan, Hillary's boyfriend. What's wrong? 
But wait, why does your face look so weird? I pushed him off me and ran away. OMG, that was horrifying. My heart was still pumping. From then on, people continued to mistake me for Hillary. Then whenever Sydney sat with me, they gossiped about how tragic it was that she was trying to be a cool kid. It made her feel uncomfortable, so she stopped hanging out with me at school. I had to sit by myself and felt so lonely. Then there was Lucas. Whenever I tried so much as hug him, he flinched. Then he admitted that he found my new look strange and intimidating. Life carried on, and prom grew closer. I noticed one of the Queen Hillary posters had been ripped off, and in its place was another poster of a girl named Kim. Jeez, this prom queen campaign seems very stressful. Then, as I stepped outside, I heard someone shout, Now! Then the next thing I knew, stuff was thrown at me. In just a blink, I was covered in tomatoes and eggs. Yuck! Then a group of girls smirking stepped out and one said, You should just give up trying to be prom queen before it's too late. I blurted out while taking pieces of eggshell off of my hair. What? Why attack me? Oh wait! Girls, it's the plastic Hillary wannabe. Well, you still deserve this. Have fun being a failed version of Hillary. They laughed as they left, leaving me standing there feeling worse than ever. I went to the bathroom to clean myself up and walked in on Hillary applying her makeup in the mirror. Whoa, her face actually wasn't so perfect with all the makeup on. Oh wow, it's you. She glanced at me. You know, everyone is talking about you even more than me, she said, while covering her eyelid with tons of eyeshadows. I mean, I'm kind of flattered, but trust me, you look ridiculous. You're like the Walmart version of me. I feel sorry for Lucas for having a super insecure girlfriend like you. Then she flicked her hair and left. I looked at myself in the mirror, tears streaming down my face. So Hillary was just a mean girl who faked her butt off to build a friendly image and covered her mediocre face with a lot of makeup. She wasn't perfect, just like me. From then on, I desperately longed to look like myself again. I begged mom to lend me the money to fix my face, but she refused. No more. Once is enough. Isn't this all you wanted? Great. Now I was going to be stuck looking like this forever. Until one night, my cheeks started aching. Soon, I couldn't so much as twitch my face without being in serious pain. Mom found me clutching my face in agony and drove me to the hospital. The doctor told me my implants had leaked and I needed emergency surgery to remove them. This happened a few months ago. Now, when I look in the mirror, luckily, I don't see Hillary anymore. Instead, I see me, but in a quite different look. I've well and truly learned my lesson, and Sydney and Lucas have been there to help me through everything. Now I know that I should have learned how to love myself instead of comparing myself to someone else. I am who I am. And you know what? I now realize that I'm okay with that. I've always been an overly possessive kind of girl, and I can't stand it if people touch stuff that belongs to me, especially if they do it without asking my permission first. And my boyfriend is no exception to that rule. Honestly, I was so worried that he'd cheat on me that I literally couldn't sleep at night. And then I did something that I'll regret for the rest of my life. I met Otis in the guitar club at school. He was tall, handsome, and smart, which made him very popular. But he's not a playboy. He'd only ever dated one girl called Sam before, who he broke up with last year. I often wondered if he still loved her, but I'd started to notice him always sitting next to me in the guitar club, and soon we were talking a lot. One day, he confessed that he had a major crush on me and asked me to be his girlfriend. I couldn't believe it. I was on cloud nine. But very quickly, I started to panic. 
I didn't want any other girl stealing him from me. I made our relationship very public and shared our photos on every social media platform. We were inseparable, and I always kept my eyes on him. Otis seemed fine with this. In fact, he thought it was kind of cute how much I doted on him. But none of that eased my obsession with the fact that he might cheat on me. It was all I thought about. So there was only one thing for it. I had to test him. I had to make sure he really loved me. I created a few fake social media accounts and used images of really hot girls to see if Otis would flirt with them. Then I tried to add him as a friend from these accounts and send him flirty messages. One time, I even sent super sexy photos to him from one of these fake accounts. Believe it or not though, he ignored them. I felt so relieved. So he did love me. I could relax. Well, for the moment, anyway. But it didn't take long for the worry to set in again. I'm not proud to admit this, but I even hired a boyfriend test service. I chose the most beautiful girl, even though the service was crazy expensive. I had it all planned out. It was just Otis and I at my house one night. We ordered dinner, and then I told him I needed to go buy some soda at the store. After I left, the girl arrived disguised as the delivery guy. She brought the food into Otis, and I sat in the car outside watching them on my phone. The girl had attached a mini camera onto the box of food, and she placed it on the table so I could clearly see everything happening between them. She was so seductive in her tight, mini dress and kept flirting with Otis, but he just wasn't interested. I sat in the car amazed. I was so proud of him. I had been sure he'd not be able to resist her. After that, I decided that I'd played enough games, and now I could really trust him. But then, one day at school, Sam and her new boyfriend, Lewis, walked past our table. She looked at Otis and said, You two look happy, don't you? I'm glad you finally found someone to replace me. Then she just walked away, without so much as even glancing in my direction. It was like I was invisible to her. So, she thought I was just some replacement, huh? That was it. I had to prove to her that Otis loved me now and that she meant nothing to him. Later that night, I texted her on social media, annoyed that she thought I was scared and jealous of her and that Otis only loved her? I couldn't believe it! I didn't know why Otis had dated someone like her before. I got annoyed and gave her a challenge that we would flirt with each other's boyfriends for a week and see whose boyfriend was a faithful person. She said it sounded fun and that she'd love a challenge like this. But really, I was only doing this to make sure Otis really loved me and had no more feelings for Sam. So the plan was set. That weekend, both Sam and I asked our boyfriends to go to the cinema, but then at the last minute, we both made up excuses about why we couldn't go, even though our boyfriends had already bought the tickets. I went to the cinema where Sam's boyfriend, Lewis was, and acted as if it was just by chance that I was there too. I asked why he was alone, and he said, Oh, Sam had a family thing, so I've been stood up. I told him I was on my way to buy a ticket, and he said I could just use Sam's. Yes, the plan was working. We watched the movie together and even hung out afterwards to chat. After that night, Lewis messaged me a few times, and one day, I even walked home from school with him. By the end of that week, it became clear to me that Lewis was actually interested in me, and he even invited me out for dinner. Otis was also still giving me lots of attention. He even told me about what Sam had been doing and was very apologetic. He kept saying it was really annoying, and why couldn't she just leave him alone? I was so happy to hear this. It felt like I'd won. Both guys liked me, and no one liked Sam. I decided to meet Louis for dinner and wait for him to tell me how he felt about me. Then I could tell Sam and she'd be so upset. Served her right, though, for assuming Otis was still in love with her. But that night, things didn't go exactly as planned. We were sitting having dinner when all of a sudden, Lewis leaned into me and kissed me passionately. I closed my eyes and all I could think about was how I'd won. And Sam had lost. But then I heard a click-click sound and I froze. I opened my eyes, turned around, and there was Sam, standing there taking photos of us. She started laughing like a crazy person, and Lewis walked over to her and joined her. 
I had no idea what was going on. But then they told me. They'd deliberately done this. Sam had told Lewis to pretend to fall for me just so she could catch me out. I couldn't believe it. How could she be so evil? She sent all the photos to Otis, and now I feel so ashamed. Otis was so angry, and no matter how much I tried to explain, he wouldn't believe me. And it's all my fault, all because of my possessiveness. What can I do to get Otis to understand I didn't mean it, and that I really love him? So everyone loves Christmas, right? Trust me. It's not so great when your boss fires you in November. How was I supposed to buy presents now? Still, I tried to see the positives. I hated that boring, underpaid, overworked job anyway. My ex-boss Adrian was the worst. He's a crazy perfectionist who always gave me ridiculous deadlines, complained about every tiniest mistake, and flipped out if things didn't go his way. No wonder he was still single at 32. Who could ever stand him? I wouldn't miss him, or my tragic ass-kissing co-workers. Anyways, on the bright side, I'd get to spend the entire holiday season with my family and my boyfriend Matt in peace, without being bothered by any annoying work emails. I, in fact, have invited Matt over for Thanksgiving dinner with my parents, and plan to spend this cozy weekend with my loved ones. Then, the day before Thanksgiving, I packed up my car and was about to go and pick Matt up when my phone beeped. Sonia. I don't think Thanksgiving is a good idea. I just think we need some time apart. Hope you have a great time. See you around. X. What? Had he just broken up with me over text message? I immediately rang him up, but he turned his phone off. Just great. Here I was, stuck at home for the entire Thanksgiving and Christmas period, being a jobless, boyfriendless loser. To make it worse, even my little sister Gina had a boyfriend who adored her. This is so unfair. One night, my parents were out to buy a Christmas tree, and Gina had her boyfriend over to help put up Christmas lights and decorations. Well, needless to say, love was in the air, and that festive vibe didn't help at all with my misery. So I refused to join them and curled up in my room. Feeling so lonely and miserable, I downloaded Tinder. I usually wasn't one for dating apps, but I was feeling so low, I would have happily spoken to anyone. I didn't feel like being me. I was sick of being me, so I used the fake name Crystal and just put some artsy scenery pictures up. I could be whoever I wanted to be. And you know what? It seemed to be working, as a few guys wanted to talk to me. Okay, most of them were also bored, or only after one thing, but then there's this guy called Carl that caught my attention. Like me, he had no pictures of himself, but instead, he had images of song lyrics and movie quotes, including the quote, The more you know who you are and what you want, the less you let things upset you. I love the movie Lost in Translation, so I sent him a message telling him he had good taste in films, and he messaged me back complimenting the scenery photos I took. After that, we started chatting days and nights. We talked about everything, from the dumb to the meaningful. He actually helped me out a lot and made the Christmas period bearable for me. It was all going great, until Christmas Eve. He sent me a message to wish me a Merry Christmas, along with, let's meet up for a drink. Oh no. Even though the app said he was only a few miles away, I wasn't ready for meetups. I actually was nervous upon reading his text. My heart was pounding, and I found myself worrying about what he would think of me when we met. What if he didn't look like what I imagined? What if he'd be disappointed when he saw me? Why does that even matter though? Unless, I developed feelings for him. I don't even know anymore. But it's certain that I couldn't face him just yet. I politely refused his invitation. He was cool about it. Then we still continued to talk like normal. I survived Christmas. And then for New Year's Eve, Gina persuaded me to go to a party with her boyfriend and friends. I wasn't really keen to join, but I guessed I needed to do something to stop this gloominess. As I was walking in, I was so busy brushing off the snow on my shoulder that I bumped into a guy. To my horror, I looked up and saw that it was my old boss, Adrian. Why was he here, in my hometown? He was also shocked, but managed to smile at me. But I just gave him a glare, rolled my eyes, flipped back my hair, then strode off. What a mood killer! I grabbed a drink and sat in the corner in an attempt to avoid bumping into Adrian again. Gina found me and tried dragging me onto the dance floor, but I refused. Then she winked at me and in a tipsy voice said, You need a man to dance with. 
I'll be right back. Five minutes later, she excitedly waved at me and shouted over, Found one! I just want to facepalm as I saw her dragging Adrian by the hand over to me. Talk about awkward. But still, I mumbled out a hi, downed a shot for courage, and then chatted to him. Okay, it turns out he was visiting his grandparents who lived around here, and he was actually an okay guy to talk to. After I spent most of the night talking to him, he bought a drink, then said to me, I have to admit that after the death stare you gave me on entry, I was afraid for my life. But it turns out, I've enjoyed chatting with you. Sorry, I blushed. No, it's okay. I'd be mad with me too if I were you. Letting you go from work was nothing personal. I had to let one person go, and I only chose you because I knew you were wasted there. Um, thanks, I guess, I laughed. Let's get another shot. Okay, so maybe Adrian wasn't that bad of a person after all. And I don't know if it's because of all the drinks we downed, the atmosphere, or the fact that everyone else around us was sharing New Year's kisses, that I almost felt like Adrian looked like he wanted to kiss me on the strike of midnight too. And I too didn't dodge it. Luckily, nothing happened. I mean, that would have been weird, right? The next day, Adrian messaged me, saying he would help me set up a job interview at a big media company. Wow, that's amazing! Now I had no excuse to sulk around anymore. I needed to get back to the city and sort my life out. Only, I still couldn't get Carl out of my head. I guessed these feelings were real. To clear up my mind, I decided to confess to him online. But then he messaged me back saying, I think you're great and I love talking to you, but I have a crush on my coworker. I'm sorry, but I'd like to stay friends. Ouch, rejection hurt! Back in the city, I felt lonelier than ever. Yes, I'd got the new job and it was going well, but I was sick of seeing loved up couples everywhere. To make it worse, Gina came to stay with me for a while and she's always on the phone, giggling and FaceTiming her boyfriend. Now I couldn't even escape lovebirds in my own apartment. Feeling down, I messaged Carl again, just casually asked him to meet up later this weekend when I would be back home again for my mom's birthday. Well, to be honest, I just couldn't give him up just yet. Maybe he would change his mind when we met, or I would be able to get over him once we meet. But he made up some excuse to reject me again. That was it, I told myself. It's official over now. Depressed, I called Adrian up for a drink. He arrived looking kinda cute, but the sting of rejection was still on my mind. I confided to Adrian, and I asked him if he thought Carl was a fool for turning me down. Adrian slammed his drink onto the table and turned to me and said, You're the fool. Why are you stupidly chasing after some guy online? He might not even be real. He might be some 60-year-old pervert. Why won't you just open your eyes and look in front of you? Then he stood up, locked me in his arms, and tried to kiss me. What? I was so mad I pulled myself away from him and slapped him straight across the face before I stomped off. He was meant to be my friend, not some guy after just one thing. I was so hurt, I cried while texting Carl about what just happened, but he didn't reply. The next day, I woke up with a pounding head and puffy eyes. I checked my phone. Adrian had called me, but nothing from Carl. He must have been too busy with his coworker, huh? Suddenly, I heard the door knock. My sister answered it and told me it was Adrian. I reluctantly went out to see him. I mean, I guess I needed to at least hear him out. He was standing there looking sheepish as he said, I'm so sorry about last night, Sonia. I was slightly drunk and I guess I've read the signals wrong. For what it's worth, I think that Carl guy is a fool for letting you go. You're amazing. I wasn't in the mood to talk to him, so said it was fine, then told him to leave. I closed the door and threw myself on the sofa. Then about ten minutes later, there was someone at the door again. I answered it, and there was Adrian, but this time, he changed his outfit. Confused, I grumbled, what else do you want? Then, he politely greeted me. Hello, Crystal. Let me introduce myself. I'm Carl. We've been talking for months. I guess, if you think about it, the more you know who you are and what you want, the less you let things upset you. I stared at him open-mouthed. He just quoted Lost in Translation, and he'd called me Crystal. Then reality struck me. OMG! All this time? And Adrian was Carl? I dragged him inside. We sat down on the sofa and talked everything out. It's so unreal! Turns out the guy I've been chasing after is literally right in front of me. How ironic! 
I was so happy I hugged him and broke down crying, apologizing. Right then, my sister walked out from the kitchen, took one look at us, and laughed out, Well, 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 isn't this the awful boss who fired you? But most importantly, isn't he the guy I brought to you at the New Year's Eve party? You two owe me big time. We all burst out laughing. So, yeah, after a horrid holiday season... Now I finally could start a promising new year with a great job and a pretty awesome new boyfriend. I guess things always have a way of working out in the end, right? Thank you for listening to my story, and wish you guys a good start into the new year! It was just a regular school day and I was sorting out my locker when suddenly I heard hushed whispers and noticed that everyone else was staring at something. Okay, so turns out it wasn't a something, but a someone. As this pretty girl strutted down the corridor like it was a runway or something. Ugh. Why was everyone gawping at her, rushing over to greet her and sticking notepads in her face for her to sign? I hugged my books and muttered, Geez, there's nothing special about her. So, my name's Lily and I'm just a normal girl. My family, yeah, they're normal. My appearance, normal. And my social status, well, that's just normal too. I coast through life and that's it. Nothing exciting ever happens to a regular girl like me. Oh, how I long to be the perfect looking girls on Instagram. They're so flawless in their clear skin, stylish clothes, and glossy hair. But those girls were different. They were from different worlds. Oh well, at least I still had my books, my bestie Sarah, and my cute boyfriend Brian. But this all changed when Stacy rocked up at school with her perfect looks and her I'm so sweet and friendly routine. Yeah, right. So what if she had a prettyish face and a bit part in some TV show underneath the fake shine she was clearly not all that? I walked into English class to see her sitting at the desk next to mine. Ugh, great. I couldn't even get to my seat because everyone else was surrounding her. Asking her dumb questions such as, What shampoo do you use? And do you get snack breaks when you film your show? Jeez, give me a break instead. Then, when I finally managed to sit down, she smiled at me and in this sickly sweet voice said, Hi, I hope it's okay I sit here. I'm Stacy. Yeah, sure. I forced a smile back, but on the inside, my anger was boiling over. Who did this girl think she was? So what if she was beautiful? I bet she only cared about her looks and never bothered studying. Yeah, everyone else would soon realize what a failure she was. Then, one time during recess, Stacy, the living Barbie doll, suggested we start a yearbook and now everyone's treating her like she's achieved world peace or something. Ugh, you know the worst part of it? I've been saying we should start a yearbook for years, but no one listened to me. And guess who received so many welcome cards and love notes that they fell out of her locker and obstructed the hallway? Yup, Stacy. Gosh, it's been like weeks already. When will these stop? I hated how she thanked everyone and blushed and ugh. I needed to be around a sane person who didn't think the sun shone out of her. She was everywhere. It made me sick. But thank God for lunchtime. It became the only peaceful time of the day for me when I could hang out with Sarah and not have to worry about Stacy. But ha, huh, what was this? What was that Barbie doll doing sitting at our table and talking to my best friend. I walked over there and placed my tray down next to Sarah. Oh, hi Lily. Stacy just said the funniest thing. Great, I muttered under my breath. Lunch was an ordeal. Sarah ignored me and kept on asking Stacy dumb questions like, Is your co-star Kyle as handsome in real life? And how do you style printed skirts with a colored tee? Yawn! Later that day, due to a paint spillage in art, I was five minutes late out. Sarah had agreed to drive me home, but I went out to the parking lot. Her car wasn't there. Then I checked my phone and saw that she'd messaged me. Where are you? I can't wait anymore. I'll leave first with Stacy. See you tomorrow, X. What? Is she ditching me to give that phony a ride? 
We had been friends since childhood. How could she be fooled for Stacy's act and just throw away our friendship like that? Angry, I messaged her back. You abandoned me for Little Miss Popular? How could you? I get it. New one in, old one out. Well, thanks a lot. My phone buzzed with her reply. Lily, you know it isn't like that. You live up the road from school, while Stacy lives much further away, and she needed to get back in time to get ready for her filming schedule. Matter than ever, I quickly typed out my reply. What? Ever. It's too bad you'll always be a nobody in her eyes, and she's just using you for a free ride. Then I chucked my phone onto my bed. I'd had enough. Sarah had made her choice, and it was to be friends with that fake over me. Sarah may have fallen into the Stacy trap, but at least I still had Brian, right? One afternoon, I was talking to him out in the schoolyard when Stacy tottered past. Even her try to hard walk was annoying. She smiled over my Brian. Then she deliberately tripped up and dropped the books she was holding. I grabbed Brian's arm to stop him from going over, but he shook himself free from my grip and went over to her anyway. I watched him help her pick her books up, and then she blushed and squeaked out a thank you. She was the worst. When he walked back over to me with this big grin on his face, I couldn't take it anymore. So I blurted out to him, "How dare you leave me to help?" Her. He gave me a confused look. Lily, I was just helping her out. Yeah, right. You knew she dropped them on purpose to get your attention, but you went over there to her anyway because you think she's prettier than me. He sighed. You're being ridiculous. You know what? I can't deal with your selfish, jealous streak anymore. Let's just call it a day. We're done. Then he walked off. I stood there watching him, expecting him to cool down and come back. Only he didn't. This was all Stacy's fault. She'd stolen my best friend and my boyfriend. No more. It was time to show her that she wasn't so perfect after all. I scrolled through her social media pages for ideas, and it soon became apparent that she loves boys with toned abs who ride motorbikes. How predictable! I discovered this website where I could hire a boy to play with her heart, then ditch her. It's about time she learned how much it sucked to be undesirable and worthless. Ha! I found the perfect guy called Josh. He was 19, a gym addict, and he had a motorbike. Whoa, he was expensive, but it would be worth it, right? I arranged to meet him at the local coffee shop, and jeez, he was even more handsome in person. I wished I could use this money to actually make him mine. Sigh. So the deal is, he's gonna flirt with Stacy, make her love him deeply, and then break up with her. The next Monday, I walked out of school to see Josh parked up to the school gate, holding his helmet and looking like he belonged in a movie. Naturally, every girl was staring at him, but he made a beeline for Stacy. Then, just one week later, I saw him picking up Stacy from the school. Whoa! I knew that. I knew I had chosen the right person. Josh was such a lady killer. They looked super close, and I had to remind myself that he was just an actor and he was doing his job. Ha <laughs> ha! She was gonna be so heartbroken. But a few weeks later, and he was still picking her up. Huh? Why hadn't he broken up with her yet? So I called him up and asked him what was taking him so long. He replied that he would do it soon. He was just making her fall for him more before he did it. <laughs> Brutal. Only the weeks passed by, and he still hadn't ended it. Then I was walking past the movie theater, and I spotted them there kissing. What? This was not the plan. Furious, I had arranged to meet him the next day at the coffee shop. He walked over and couldn't even meet my eye as he said, "I'm sorry, I can't do this anymore. I will refund you as soon as I can." Um, why? <laughs> Have you fallen in love with her or something? I said jokingly. There was a long silence. Then he looked down at the table and muttered out, "Yeah, I have." Why was I the only one on the planet who saw how thick she was? Thanks to her siren ways, I lost my best friend, my boyfriend, and now my savings. This was it. I needed to confront her. The next day at school, I tried finding her, but she was nowhere to be found. Then, as I passed through the school garden, I saw her sitting there. Gotcha. It's time to tell her exactly what I thought of her. I stormed over to her and opened my mouth to speak. But huh? Why was she crying? When she saw me, she managed to smile and said, "Oh, hi, Lily. Is there a chance you could help me?" 
I stared at her with disbelief. Did she think I was under her spell and would do her bidding? But then I saw what she was crying about. In her hands was her English essay with a big F on it. So I replied, um, why me? You're so smart. You answer all the questions in class correctly. I don't want to be judged on my bad grades. That's why I left my last school. The other kids call me a brainless beauty. I moved here for a fresh start and now I'm still failing. Okay, so in that moment, I realized that there were things I was good at. My grades were good and I was pretty great at remembering facts. I'd just been so blinded by jealousy that I lost focus on these things and only saw what I didn't have. None of this was Stacy's fault. She never actually done anything bad to me. I'd made it all up in my head because I was jealous of her. So I sat down next to her and said, No one's going to call you that because I'll help you study. You will? She gave me a hopeful smile and I nodded. Thank you so much, she flung her arms around me. So that's how Stacy went from being my enemy to my friend. She's actually a really sweet and kind-hearted girl. No wonder why everyone admired her so much. And I was wrong to judge her on her appearance and not give her a fair chance. She's still with Josh and she doesn't know that I hired him to break her heart. But hey, she now has a hunky boyfriend who adores her, so that could be considered compensation, right? Brian and I are still over, but thinking about it, maybe this was for the best. I know I overreacted, but he gave me up so easily, and well, I want to find a guy who won't do that. As for Sarah, I went around to her house with a bag full of her favorite candy, and I apologized for being a jealous jerk. Luckily for me, she forgave me. Now, Sarah, Stacy, and I have become good friends. Sarah and I both help Stacy with her studies, and she gives us fashion tips. And you know what? I've come to realize that I'm pretty after all. I just needed to discover my spark. So finally, I learned that no one's perfect. Perfection is just an illusion. The most important thing is that we feel happy with what we own and never stop improving ourselves. So just be you and let everyone else concentrate on being them. Scott, I said it's over. You're just too immature for me. He gave me a quizzing look, then said, Huh? What? Babe, we're great together. I rolled my eyes. I just figured I don't need to be with someone with such a childish mentality. I need someone mature and... Whatever, Linda. Find me when you change your mind, he grunted. Then he put his earphones in and walked off. Well, at 15... I needed a guy with a certain maturity, not some loser who still found fart jokes funny. Please. My friends, Patty and Louise, agreed with me. I'm far too popular, pretty, and confident to date just anyone. Anyway, as luck should happen, I was walking along the school corridor when I saw this lost-looking but amazingly handsome guy. Flicking out my hair, I approached him with my friendliest voice. Hey, are you okay? Flustered, he replied, Yes, um, which way is it to the principal's office? I'm going that way anyway, so I'll show you. This was a blatant lie, as my class was in the other direction, but he didn't know that. Later that day, I walked into physics class with Lewis and stopped dead. Standing at the front of the class was that handsome guy. It turns out he was the substitute teacher and written on the board behind him, was the name Mr. Halton. My first name is Colin, by the way, he smiled. I whispered to Lewis, seems like science class has heated up. Then I walked over to my seat. There's no way I could concentrate on the density of materials, not with the hottest teacher ever sharing the same airspace as me. I needed to find a way to get to know him and show him that I wasn't like the other girls my age. Instead, I was far more mature and self-assured than them. So, at the end of class, I walked over and asked him if he'd go over a few things with me. He gladly agreed, so I got to sit down next to him and daydreamed in the scent of his musky cologne. Physics class became my favorite. With my head in my hands, I watched him address the class. He saw me looking at him a few times, but he always quickly looked away. It's okay. I got it. He was just trying to look professional. Then, one time he asked the question, According to Einstein, is light a partial or a wave? 
I stuck my hand in the air and grinned. He looked a little flustered. Linda? I puckered my lips and looked straight at him. That shirt color really suits you, sir. It brings out your eyes. Some of the other kids in class laughed, and he awkwardly fiddled with his collar. So cute. Then he coughed and said, <clears throat> Linda, do you know the answer? Oh, what was the question again? I stared dreamily at him. Honestly, I couldn't remember anything afterwards but his charmingly severe look. Then one afternoon, Colin asked me to stay behind after class. Result, he must have fallen for this Linda's irresistible charms, didn't he? I shyly stood before him, and in a serious tone, he said, Linda, is everything okay with you? You seem off lately. No, sorry, it's awful. I glumly looked down at my feet and took a few seconds to continue. My family is so poor, and my home life is just horrible. I only have nice things because my friends lend me stuff. His gaze softened. I pretended to dab at my fake tears. Please, don't tell anyone. I couldn't cope with the shame. It's enough just having you to talk to. I smiled at him. Yeah, sure. He looked at me gently and said, Anytime. Oh my. His eyes were so big and blue and mmm. I could drown in them. He obviously liked me too. He just couldn't do anything about it yet as he was nervous. With him being my teacher and all. But soon he'd realize that me and him were so meant to be. Like Ariana Grande and Dalton Gomez. I continued to stay behind after classes so I could talk to Colin about my make-believe terrible home life. He always listened and told me it'd be okay. He was so sweet and sensitive. Then one time I left Colin's classroom to find Scott there, waiting for me. Ugh. I told him to go away and started walking, but he followed me. So what? You're into old men now? What? I glared at him. Yeah, I'm not stupid. I know you like Mr. Halton. You need to snap out of that dreamland and see he's on a different level to you. Angered by this, I looked him square in the eye and snidely replied, No, Scott, you're the one on a different level to me. About 50 levels down, to be precise. I gave the thumbs down sign. He looked wounded as he turned his back to me and started walking off. He had it coming. I walked outside to see Scott lingering around, talking to Patty and Lewis. They didn't see me, so I overheard Scott say, She can't see how tragic she's being. You know her. She's so stubborn. Of course, Mr. Halton doesn't like her in that way. Ahem. <clears throat> I faked a cough, and they all turned to look at me. I put my hand on my hip and stared them down. Look, I'm sorry, Linda. We're just worried about you. Yeah, this fantasy of yours will hurt you. Ugh! What did they know? I rolled my eyes. For your information, Colin and I are really dating. In fact, he's taking me out tonight, so I can't hang out. I walked off the other way, knowing full well that the looks on their face would be priceless. I know Colin wasn't actually my boyfriend, yet, but I knew it would happen soon. It was written in the stars. The next day, as I walked into school, I noticed some of the other kids whispering to each other and pointing at me. Okay, weird. Maybe it was my new dress or something. I bought it because it was an exact colored match to Colin's eyes. But things got weirder in physics class, because as soon as Colin walked in, everybody started giggling. Colin looked confused and said, Okay, what's so funny? Then this girl, Sally, shyly muttered out, Sir, we heard you have a new girlfriend. He raised an eyebrow. Yes, that's correct. How do you know? He gave a nervous laugh. Actually, this shirt is a gift from her. I felt the entire class's eyes turn to me. Well, except for Collins. I tried to keep my cool, but inside I was fuming. How dare some other woman steal my man and force him to wear that hideous shirt? I knew I needed to keep up the lie, so after class, I walked over to Lewis and Patty and said, How cute does Cullen look in that shirt? They both frowned at me. Then Patty replied, So you really are dating him? Yep. I gave a nod. Right. She gave a skeptical look. They all needed to realize that Colin and I were the real deal. So I bought a box of candy and cut out a heart-shaped tag saying, Love you, honey, with my candy floss scented gel pen. I did feel kind of nervous as I walked over to him, but our love was meant to be. Hi, Linda. Can I help you? I got you this. I placed the gift down on his desk. He read the note and his face fell. Then 
In a firm voice, he said, Look, Linda, this is wrong. No, I shook my head. I know you like me. Linda, please, you're my student. You're just a child. No, we're meant to be together. You love me. I know you do. I don't, he said sternly. Now please leave. He rejected me? This had to be down to his new girlfriend. She was obviously poisoning his mind, as there was no way he couldn't like me. I wasn't leaving the room until he admitted he loved me too. So, crying, I sat down on the floor and folded my arms. Right at that moment, Patty and Louise rushed into the room and helped me up. Then they stared daggers at Colin as they led me out into the corridor. Turned out they'd followed me and observed through the window. How embarrassing. Thinking quick, I blubbered out, He's such a jerk. I devoted all of myself to him, but he's bored of me now, so he dumped me. Just like that. My friends comforted me as they told me he wouldn't get away with it. There's no way I could face Colin again just yet. So, I feigned being sick and stayed home. Only when I returned to school, he wasn't there. Then, the principal called me to their office. I walked in to see both my parents sitting there with devastated looks on their faces. Oh no. What was going on? Sweetie, we're sorry for not protecting you more. Mom looked over at me with glassy eyes. Then the principal said, Mr. Halton has been fired, and the police are investigating him. Rest assured, nothing like this will happen again. Huh? Colin had been fired? Why? Then the reality hit me. It was because they thought he'd been having a relationship with me. I muttered out, No, you've got it all wrong. Nothing happened. Linda, I know this is difficult, but he's a bad man. It didn't matter what I said. They remained convinced that I was so manipulated by Colin that I'd say anything to clear his name. Straight after the meeting, I found Patty and Luis, and they confessed that they hated seeing me so upset, so they'd told the principal about me and Colin. I took a deep breath, then I blurted out, but I made it up, all of it. Of course, they were super angry with me for lying, but after bearing their tantrums for some 30 minutes, they agreed to help me clear his name. So they went to the cop station with me, and we told them everything. It worked, as Colin had his name cleared, but unsurprisingly, he never came back to teach at my school. The three of us were suspended from school, and my parents grounded me for a month. Patty and Louise are still my friends, but I can see they don't trust me anymore. Anytime I tell them anything, they give each other these yeah-right looks. I feel so guilty for everything I did. It was never meant to go that far, but I now realize that my childish behavior almost cost a good man his future. I wish I could apologize to Colin in person, but I know I'll never get a chance to. Please be careful with your words, as they could ruin someone's career, life, everything. If, like me, you adore your teacher, then please just respect them, be nice, and let them be. Hi guys, I'm Chrissy, and my high school life took a drastic turn thanks to my crazy, overprotective mom. You see, my parents divorced when I was a little kid. I stayed with my mom, but she worked for the criminal investigation department, which meant she was super busy, so the house chores remained undone, and we lived off takeaways. Trust me, having pizza and egg fried rice every night isn't as good as it sounds. My grandparents could see that my mom was struggling to juggle her work and home life commitments, so I went to stay with them. I didn't mind this, as mom always visited me on weekends. Besides, grandma's meals are delicious. But then, mom switched departments. She went from chasing criminals to handling paperwork at the station. Due to these changes in circumstances, she had far more time on her hands, so I moved back in with her. It's only by living with her that I realized just how different she is to me. Talk about my opposite, as she's strong, fierce, and impulsive. Basically, she's like a man, while I'm a sweet girly girl who loves wearing pretty clothes and watching cute movies. You can imagine my horror when I invited my bestie, Sharon, over, and mom was walking around the house in a skull print tank top, ripped jeans, and biker boots. She looked like she was going on a bike rally. Yeah. This was just her usual style, but I was expecting she would at least act normal for once when we had a guest around. It was so cringe. She was almost 40, not 15. 
Then, on my first day of high school, mom insisted she take me there and pick me up, as she was worried there might be troublemakers on the bus. Yep, I know, this was ridiculous. I mean, how delicate does she think I am? But I didn't want to upset her, so I reluctantly agreed. School's out, and I was chatting with my friends while waiting for my mom to show up, when we suddenly heard the sound of a motorbike engine coming toward the school. Me and my friends got excited and whistled as we thought a cute guy was passing by. But then they stopped near us and took off their helmet. I literally wanted to faint. It was my beloved mother. Oh, sweet Jesus. What on earth was she doing? My mom shouted with joy. Hey, Chrissy, get on. Then she held a spare helmet out to me. I swear it was like the whole school was outside watching us. How embarrassing! When we arrived home, I asked her where the bike had come from. She replied, What? Oh, you mean Eleanor? I just bought her last week. The weather is so nice today, so I thought I would bring her along. Yes, you heard her right. My mom named the bike after Eleanor Roosevelt. Unbelievable! The embarrassment didn't end there. Oh no. One day, my teacher informed us that tomorrow after school was a parent-teacher conference. I couldn't have mom turning up in a teenage rebel outfit, so I searched her closet for something mom-like. Nope. All my mom owned were t-shirts, ripped shorts, and crop tops. Ugh! So I went online and found this beautiful blue dress, then I told her to buy it. The next day after school, I waited for mom in my form room. All the parents were already there. Only my mom was missing. I was about to call her when suddenly somebody walked into the room. Oh. My. God. Someone, please knock me out right now. It was my mom, and you wouldn't believe what she was wearing. No, it wasn't the blue dress. Instead, it was this super skinny black leather dress, black sunglasses, 10-inch high heels, and a black choker necklace. She looked like she belonged in a vampire movie. Everyone was gawping at her. I think some of the dads were even drooling a bit. When I confronted her about it, she just shrugged and said, Sweetie, this dress is much more my style than that mumsy blue one. Now this was officially my number one most embarrassing moment ever. Thanks, Mom. Why couldn't she be like me? I mean, I was starting to think that I was the adult here, not her. The embarrassment didn't end there. Instead, she took it to a whole new level. My school was planning a camping trip, and I was so excited about it. Mom wanted to come along and supervise, but I firmly said no. She started saying, but honey, you don't know how dangerous the woods are. What if you got bitten by a snake? Do you know how to handle that? I don't think so. What? She was just being ridiculous again. We argued for a while, but in the end, she agreed to let me go without her. The trip was so much fun, and some cute boys asked Sharon and me if we wanted to go for a swim in the lake. Of course, we said yes. I mean, look at them. They were so cute. Suddenly, I heard screaming. It was Sharon. She said someone was hiding in the bushes and watching us. That was so creepy. The cute boys said they'd go and check it out, but then this person jumped out of the bush and did a judo throw on them. Wait a minute, I know that move. Could it be? Oh no, it was my mom. What was she wearing? She was in full army gear. She even had binoculars. Jeez, mom, what were you doing looking like a G.I. Joe? I couldn't hold my tears and I cried out, Oh my God, why can't you leave me alone? You're ruining everything. Then I ran back to the camp. She left after that, but I felt so embarrassed for the rest of the trip. When I returned home, my mom immediately said sorry to me and swore that something like that would never happen again. Okay, I could see in her eyes that she really meant it, so I would give her another chance. She calmed down a lot after that and even let me go to school by myself. Well, that was big progress, don't you think? Soon after that, I started to date this boy named Kevin. And boy, was he hot! He was one of the popular kids at school, so I still couldn't believe he chose me. I don't know how mom found out about him, but she did, and she insisted on inviting him over for dinner. 
I made her agree not to do anything crazy. I mean, what was the worst that could happen? The dinner was going well, until we got to dessert. Then mom started asking him awkward questions, like, Kevin, how many girls have you dated? And, I assume you two have health classes at school? Or should I remind you of some important facts? Oh, sweet Jesus, mom! Her questions were beyond embarrassing. Kevin just sat there with a super awkward smile on his face and didn't answer. But then mom announced it was very late and practically shoved him out of the house. Huh, it was only 8.30 p.m. After he left, I went straight to my mom and we started arguing. Mom, you agreed not to do anything crazy. Why can't you act like a normal mom? She replied, Oh, honey, that Kevin guy is really cute, but he's not good for you. I know his type. They only want to take advantage of girly girls like you. What? Girly girls like me? What was that supposed to mean? I shouted back. You're doing it again! You're being overprotective! That's because you're not tough enough. If you wouldn't be so girly and be a badass like your mom, I wouldn't have to protect you all the time. I stormed up to my room and slammed the door shut. I was so going to prove to her that she was wrong about Kevin and that I didn't need her protection. Fortunately, mom hadn't scared Kevin off. Phew! He told me that his parents were super embarrassing too. One evening, Kevin took me to this nice restaurant. There were candles, live music, and the food was delicious. It was so romantic. Then he touched my hand and leaned in closer. This was so exciting. I was about to have my first kiss. Suddenly, someone banged on the table nearby and ruined the moment. That's when I noticed they had a keychain on their bag that looked exactly like the one I'd made once at summer camp. I stood up and walked toward the table. A middle-aged lady with blonde hair and sunglasses was sitting there. I tried to look at her face, but it was like she was avoiding me. I took a closer look, and I couldn't believe it. I ripped the wig off her head, and yes, it was my beloved mother, again! To be honest, I didn't want to argue with her anymore. Today was proof that she just couldn't change. So I just said in a calm voice, I hate you, mom. You're the worst mom ever. Then I grabbed Kevin's arm and ran out of there. Okay, maybe what I said was a bit harsh, but she just ruined what would have been my first kiss. I couldn't concentrate on our date after that, so I asked Kevin to take me home. But to my surprise, he drove me back to his place. Uh-oh, I knew what that meant. But I wasn't ready for any of that yet, so I told him I'd get an Uber. Suddenly, he grabbed my arm and tried to drag me into his house. I couldn't believe this was actually happening. Mom was so right about him. I was freaking out. But then suddenly... I remembered something important that she'd taught me, so I used her signature judo move on him. It worked, as he laid on the ground and groaned out in pain. Ha! Huh. And that's when my mom arrived on her motorbike. As soon as I saw her, I ran over to her, hugged her tight, and cried like a baby in her arms. You must be wondering how my mom found me. Well... When Kevin came by to have dinner, she pickpocketed his phone and hacked it so she had access to all his messages and location. So, after I dragged him out of the restaurant, he texted his friends saying he was trying to get in bed with me at all costs, which my mom saw, so she rushed to rescue me. Oh god, mom, that was so not okay. But what could you expect from a criminal investigator? When we arrived home, we had a serious talk. To my surprise, she admitted that she was wrong about me. She saw now that I was able to take care of myself. That judo move I did on Kevin really impressed her. See? Girly girls can kick some butt too. So, from that moment on, things between us improved lots. Turns out, my mom isn't so annoying after all. I realize now that she's pretty cool, and all the things she did were just to protect me. Okay, so... Maybe she took it to the extreme levels, but she did it with good intentions. Thanks to my mom, I feel stronger now. You know what they say, I'm a strong woman because a strong woman raised me. Although, one thing's for sure, I won't be borrowing her clothes anytime soon.
How long is this gonna take? So much for taking care of me. Lex, starting today, I'm locking your phone and laptop away. Cruel! Isn't one leg cast enough punishment? Excuse me, you don't deserve to have a say in this. If you hadn't bought our daughter that death trap motorbike in the first place, she'd still be intact. Yeah, sorry for making sure she doesn't grow up boring like her mom. Yeah, another lecture on how irresponsible I was eventually turned into a quarrel between mom and dad instead. They stopped only when mom needed to leave for her business trip in Egypt. I'm done arguing with you. I have a flight to catch. I've got my eye on you, young lady. All the way from Egypt? That's kinda hard. Well, at least Dad's here, so I won't be by myself. The next morning, I woke up to see a note stuck to the fridge. Alex, I'm shooting my new movie in Spain for a few months. There is a strict no phone policy to avoid leaks. So if it isn't urgent, don't call me. Love, Dad. Seriously? Choosing work over me? Why am I still surprised? That's when you get when you have a world-famous actor dad and an award-winning photographer mom. They're rarely home, and whenever they are, they're constantly at each other's throats. All the more reason for me to hang out with my biker gang. I love motorcycles. They're my only getaway. But that's how I messed up my leg. In my defense, I could totally nail that trick and win their stupid bet if it wasn't for that bumpy road. However, not a single one of my homies has checked on me since then. Not even my boyfriend, Blake. But what's really bumming me out is that school's out for summer, yet I can hardly move. So, bored out of my mind, I came up with a new way to entertain myself, which was playing candid camera on this whole suburbia. Thanks to my mom's camera, I had eyes on the newlyweds Cunninghams on the right, the carpenters on the left, a few other houses, and ooh, tiny Timmy across the street. I swear to god, I almost thought some hunky guy had just moved in. My childhood friend, Tiny Timmy, had officially grown into Timothy. He looked just like a muscular version of Timothy Chalamet. Then Tim suddenly sat up and we accidentally made eye contact. Awkward. Looking good, handsome. He's even cuter when he smiles. Oh, he's replying. Even better up close. That's bold, Timmy. Too bad though. Sorry, lame. Tim looks confused at first, then when he saw my cast, he immediately leaves the room. Huh? A broken leg is enough to scare him off? He's lame. Then, the doorbell rang. Hey, that took a while. You're here? Of course, you need to have a closer look, and could use a hand. Or a leg. Yeah, uh, I mean, <clears throat> come help this damsel in distress. From then on, Tim came over every day to help me out around the house. He'd been really helpful and even tried riding my motorcycle so it didn't have to sit idle for too long. Other than that bulked up body, he's still the friend I knew back in the day. We still had so much fun playing video games and watching movies together. You have to watch Bodies Bodies Bodies, it's nuts. Actually, I thought you might be into Ladybird. Such a heartwarming coming-of-age story. Ew, no way. Timothy Chalamet is in it. Okay, sold. But how do you know that it'd sway me? I just do, like how I know you spy on me from time to time, which, by the way, is super creepy. Yeah, right. As if he didn't intentionally leave his blinds open while working out, Mr. Shy Guy. One day, as usual, me and Tim were hanging out, when suddenly my dear boyfriend Blake made a noisy entrance. Babe, you won't believe this. There's a raising tournament going on in the Upper West Side. You have to come. What's going on here? Sup. What do you mean, sup? Who's this little brat? Oh, this is Tim. Tim, this is Blake. Say hi. Hi. I don't care. What do you think you're doing? Watch your tongue. You've been ignoring me for weeks, and now you show up raving on about some dumb street racing contest? You don't even remember that I broke my leg, do you? But, but, you're mine! Blake was fuming like a bull ready for battle and about to throw hands at Tim, but he stopped his fist midair. A defeated looking Blake fled off as soon as he got out of Tim's grip. Coward. I apologized to Tim for dragging him into this mess, and he was surprisingly cool about it. Just curious, how did Blake and you become a thing? He's the leader of the biker gang, so I thought he was cool, but honestly, I never expected our relationship to last, just like every other couple's. Exhibit A, my parents. I see. My dad's a good example as well. Then Tim revealed that his dad left his mom for another woman last year, which really upset him. I could relate so much to his situation. 
Maybe being locked up at home wasn't so bad after all, since we had the chance to catch up on everything. But the following morning, when I was chilling in my room, something horrible caught my eye. Something blonde. It looked like she was returning a hoodie to Tim. What kind of friend borrows a hoodie and acts like that around each other? Let's see what he has to say for himself. Who's that blonde? What was she doing at your place today? What? Who? She might look like strawberry shortcake, but don't be fooled. Whatever love you two might think you have will soon fade. That sweetness will turn sour in no time. Tim just burst out laughing. What's so funny? What made you think so? You don't even know Annabelle. Don't believe me? See for yourself. I then showed him all of the secrets I'd uncovered in our seemingly quiet neighborhood. First off, the couple from number 9 were both having affairs. The daughter from number 11 was using her boyfriend to hide her real relationship with another girl. And last but not least, the Carpenters, who seemed like suburban couples goal, actually had a far from blissful life due to Mr. Carpenter's drinking problem. In conclusion, there's no such thing as real love. I see your point, but on the other side of the spectrum, genuine love does exist. Tim points the camera towards the Cunninghams. Hmm, I'm not buying their poster couple act. Then, one day, Tim said he had to work overtime at the library to prepare for an event with, you guessed it, Annabelle only. I had to hide my anger as I watched him drive off with Blondie. With nothing else to do, I decided to watch the Cunninghams. Jeez, how could they seem so lovey-dovey all the time? I wanted to take my mind off of Tim, but the more I observed them, the more I thought about him with that Barbie. That's when I saw a book that Tim borrowed for me from the library. Looks like it's time to return it. I Ubered there, but there are many people here as well. Why did Tim say that the two of them would be here alone? Tim's face turned into the scream when he saw me. Didn't think I could get this far? Hi, don't mind me. I'm just here to return this. You should have just given it to me. Oh god, no. I can see that you're busy with... Annabelle, isn't it? Yeah. How do you know my name? Oh, let's see. You remind me of that creepy doll who's also an absolute nightmare. Tim then immediately dragged me away. See? He's caring for me, not you, Annie. However, the fun was interrupted right away when I saw Blake outside. Time for you to pay. Tim immediately stood between Blake and me, but to our surprise, Blake signaled for his goons hiding close by to show themselves. Clearly outnumbered, I tried to stop the situation from getting worse. Let's be civilized here. We can sort this out without violence. You're right, babe. We can settle this with a bet. Whoever can do the trick that broke Lex's leg and top it off with the Akira slide can have her fair and square. The loser has to back down. First of all, I'm not some kind of trophy. Second of all, that stunt is incredibly dangerous. Right, Tim? Sounds worth it, though. Have both of you lost your minds? Tim went first, and even though he flunked it, he managed to land without a scratch, while Blake landed on his face. Of course, that fiasco got the whole gang so embarrassed, they scrammed immediately. But I was still so annoyed. Congratulations, you won absolutely nothing. Not that I didn't care about him, I just couldn't stand his recklessness anymore. The next day, I was woken up by a doorbell. So, what are you here for? Sorry about last night, but if you stayed longer, I could have told you that I did what I did because I like you. Romantic styles. I don't even remember since when, but I do remember how sad I was when we stopped hanging out. Believe it or not, I started working out just to impress you. Whoa, what? Tim explained that nothing was going on between Annabelle and him. They were simply co-workers. And he made up that whole thing about being alone with her at the library to see my reaction. What do you say? I can make you believe in love. Tim, don't be ridiculous. Love isn't anything like the movies. It's merely a temporary chemical reaction in your brain that makes you think you're really feeling it. Come on, just give it a chance. No, look at my parents, your father, all the families in this neighborhood. If you ask me, your feelings for me right now will fade, just like mine with Blake. I'm sorry for wasting your time. I thought I was special enough for you to take a leap of faith. Now I know how wrong I was. He then left without another word. When Tim closed his blinds, honestly, I felt a sting in my chest. This is for the best, right? I can't deny the uneasiness I felt without Tim. It's not that he didn't want us to make up. I just 
didn't know how. Seeing how happy and smiling he was with her, my uneasy feeling only grew bigger. Is this what they call love? No, no, no. It's not real. Happy looking families are not actually happy, and the Cunninghams are just good at faking it. What's that I'm hearing? Are they fighting? I saw the husband suddenly punch the wall with rage, then push the wife. I no longer had eyes on them, but could hear a huge commotion over there. What on earth is going on? Panicked, I called the cops right away. Wait a second, that means their happy marriage really was fake. I excitedly limped across the street to tell Tim about my discovery, then dragged him over to the Cunningham's front lawn. However, when the cops arrived, both of them answered the door perfectly fine. Turns out they already knew about my spying, and were so annoyed by it, they decided to pull a prank on me. Great, my curious neighbors have also witnessed this whole humiliating ordeal. But the worst part was seeing the disappointment on Tim's face. You have to stop being so stubborn. Not every family is like yours. I couldn't say a word, not even when the cops gave me a warning. That night, I tossed and turned as Tim's words wiggled around my mind. Suddenly, something caught my attention. It's from Tim's house. Some flashlights were moving around. I tried calling Tim, but he didn't answer. Of course, he'd be in deep sleep by now. Calling the cops was useless because of that very recent embarrassing incident. That's it, I'm doing it myself. Out there on Tim's front lawn, my heart was beating like crazy. Thieves! Thieves! The startled thieves turned around, so I blared the air horn, then shouted. Freeze! Stay where you are! Hands over your heads! But, obviously, I, a teenager with one working leg, never actually expected any criminal to stand still. They quickly got a hold of me, and right when I thought my life was over, get away from her! Tim, thank goodness! Other neighbors also came and stopped the thieves. Tim called the cops, and this time, they reported to the scene ASAP. Phew, that was insane. Mrs. Jones, Tim's mom, thanked me and invited me to stay the night. It's really nice of her, even though she burst out laughing when I explained the situation with the Cunninghams. When Tim went to grab some drinks for us, she asked me why I was alone in this condition. So, I spilled everything about my family. Contrary to her reaction just now, she showed me sympathy. From her experience, love didn't always have a happy ending, but it doesn't mean it's not real. Tim's dad and I had genuine feelings for each other. It's just that over time, things changed. We're open to accept this and be honest with each other. That's what real love is. I wouldn't change a thing and I would still fall crazily in love with him, despite knowing we would eventually break up. Because that's how I got Tim, the second real love of my life. Her words hit different. Maybe I'd given love a bad name. You're right, love is not at fault. And Tim is so lucky to have a loving mom like you. Meanwhile, my parents don't just hate each other, they put it all on me too. Bet you, even tonight's incident won't make them care. I see where you're coming from, but why don't you just give it a try? Their reactions might surprise you. So, I called them up, and guess what? They both sounded concerned on the phone and said they'd come home as soon as they could. See, I told you so. It's alright now. Timmy, please show Lex where she'll be sleeping. That was really brave of you. Being all heroic out there despite your whole situation? I wouldn't have risked my life if it wasn't for- If it wasn't for what? I'm all ears. For you. I'm sorry I overreacted. The thought of becoming a boring old couple who hate each other bugged me. But then I realized if we were together, we wouldn't have to be that. We could be like the Cunninghams. That doesn't sound too bad now, does it? I guess not. Next morning, I woke up to my parents' call. They actually kept their promise this time. My mom explained that she thought dad was home to take care of me, while dad absentmindedly assumed mom only left it a fit of anger and was going to return soon. So they really do care about me, they just have a terrible way of showing it. They stayed together, thinking it would be best for me, but the unending tension and bickering was eating us all up from the inside. This incident opened their eyes, so they agreed to have a peaceful divorce while still looking after me together. I'm finally free from the cast, but I actually feel even more liberated than before. Is this the power of my newfound belief in love? Is it because I've realized that love was around me all along? I'm not sure myself, but who cares? Alex and Timothy signing off.
Dad, where have you been? I, I was so worried. Go away. Don't touch me. I froze on the spot, not understanding why my once kind-hearted father was being so cold toward me. I snapped out of my daze and tried helping him forward, but he flinched me away. My eyes started to tear up, I, and I didn't know what to do. Then another woman appeared. She quickly helped him up and smiled at me. Don't worry, sweetie. I'll take care of him. Excuse me? Who was she? My mother had barely been put in the ground, and Dad had already moved on? I couldn't watch any more of this, so I quickly left the room. How could things go downhill this quickly? My life used to be so simple and perfect. I had a loving family. I was always on top at school. People always complimented me on how I inherited both the beauty and intelligence of my mom and dad. But then a traffic accident happened and took mom away from us. Ever since then, my polite, well-mannered, loving dad changed into a cruel, bitter drunk who seemed to despise me. Ugh. The next day, I arrived home from school with the worry about what state my dad would be in. But, huh? Why was Uncle Alfred on my doorstep? I invited him inside, and there was Dad, slumped on the couch, surrounded by empty beer cans. As soon as he saw us, he slurred out and started throwing the cans at us. Uncle Alfred then took me to dinner so we could have a talk, and I couldn't help the tears as I blurted out how bad things were at home. He patted my arm and said, Your father's been through a lot. I think it's best if we give him time to sort himself out. I think you should come live with us for a while. So that's how I ended up living with Uncle Alfred, Aunt Madeline, and my cousin Charity. At first, everything seemed fine. As bad as it sounds, it was a relief to be away from Dad and to be able to properly process my thoughts for once. I was so grateful to Uncle Alfred for giving me a second home. But then he went away on a business trip, and everything changed. I was walking back to my room when Charity appeared in her doorway and tripped me up. As I stumbled and landed on my hands and knees, she snorted out, Yes, that's right. Bow down to your queen, you hideous peasant. You should know your place in this house. Ugh, that girl was such a pain. Since her dad went away, she wouldn't quit tormenting me. It's ironic that her name is Charity, but she doesn't seem kind at all. I'd had enough of her cruel jibes. This had just got personal. So I angrily replied, I know you're just jealous of me because your grades suck and you're not as pretty. Charity's eyes welled up. Then she shoved past me and ran to her mom. I followed after her and explained what happened to my Aunt Madeline. She frowned at Charity, then scolded her. Phew. Fortunately, I had Aunt Madeline on my side. Anyway, justice is served, right? Wrong. As it wasn't long before my aunt's attitude changed toward me too. One time, I was helping my aunt cook a casserole when the doorbell rang. It turned out to be an old friend of my aunt. As soon as she saw me, she happily said, Wow! It's only been a few years, but Charity sure has grown up. The older she gets, the more she looks like Alfred, doesn't she? Look at her eyes and smile. I stared at Aunt Madeline in confusion and saw her mood immediately shift. That night when I brought the casserole dish out, Aunt Madeline took one bite then spat it into a napkin. You're clumsy, thoughtless, and now an awful cook? Be a bit more useful, will you? I stared at her open-mouthed, unable to find the words to say. Then Charity piped in, Please, never make this again. Casserole is so gross. Just like you. Then she smirked at me as she dumped the entire plate into the trash. Weird. Didn't Aunt Madeline tell me to cook this because it was Charity's favorite? Ugh, it seemed like life in this house wasn't going to get any easier. Over the next week, their mocking and snide comments continued. One day I styled my hair in a different way, and Charity sniggered at me. What's that? It looks like you got a lobster on your head. <laughs> Have you ever considered dyeing your hair, by the way? Because blonde really doesn't suit you. On another occasion, I was invited to a party, so I put on this cute dress, but when I walked downstairs in it, they both stared at me. My aunt said, Oh, dear. Is that piece of rag making you look even chubbier than usual? Or is it because you've been so well-fed living with us? Another time, I was sitting at the breakfast table, dabbing lip gloss onto my lips, when Charity yanked it off me. As I tried to grab it back, she sniggered out, What for? Putting this on your gross lips just makes you look desperate. No one wants to kiss you anyway. Gosh, my patience with this girl was wearing very thin. Worse still, Aunt Madeline overheard the whole thing, but she just laughed. I didn't understand why they were being like this. I knew I wasn't ugly or fat, and far from it. 
I know I'm pretty, as I was always complimented on my glossy long hair. Well, until I moved here, anyway. This was so confusing. Why were they jealous of me? It turns out that being too beautiful was not easy. Ugh. Things got trickier when my dad, who's also the school principal, returned to work after his time off. He totally ignored me, and it made me feel terrible. <sighs> then I arrived home from school to Aunt Madeline fussing over me and asking if I wanted anything to eat. Huh? What? Oh, I see. Uncle Alfred was back from his work trip. Ugh! It was time I exposed this mother-daughter duo's fake act once and for all. So that evening, I volunteered to cook. Yep, you guessed it. I made the casserole dish. As I brought it out, Charity accidentally shouted, Ew! I already told you I hate this dish. Aunt Madeline turned pale, and Charity gave this gawping, shocked look. Then I dropped to my knees and pleaded, I know I'm wrong. Please don't punish me anymore. I don't want to sleep in the basement again. Uncle Alfred looked very confused, so I continued. I forgot that Charity hates this dish. I've been punished several times, but I still keep on messing up. I'm, I'm the one to blame. What is this? I go away for a few weeks and come back to carnage? He ordered Aunt Madeline into their room for a private chat. We're not even related. Don't expect my mother and I to be nice to you she said, then stormed off. What? What did Charity mean? Of course we were related. Aunt Madeline was my dad's sister, right? I wanted to know what was going on, so I hid behind the door and listened in on their conversation. Tell me the truth. Teresa is your child with Claire, isn't she? I was taken aback. Claire? My mother? Had I misheard her? I know. Mark told me. The day Claire had the accident, they ran some blood tests, and he found out Teresa's blood type didn't match his. Obviously, she's not his biological daughter, and she looks just like you. Now tell me, did you and Claire cheat behind our backs? You used to be in love with her before you married me. So Dad treated me like that because he found out I'm not his own daughter? And Alfred and my mom used to be in love bef before she got married to my dad? Explain to me! Enough! Alfred finally spoke up. I have nothing to explain to you. Hearing footsteps toward me, I rushed to my room, closed the door, then crawled into my blanket, pretending to be asleep. Suddenly, I heard the door open. It was Alfred. Teresa, let's get out of here. I packed a bag and left with my Uncle Alfred. We moved into a small apartment not too far from his house. Even though he took care of me a lot, he never mentioned that day ever again. I didn't dare to ask either. So we just let it slide. He had to be my real dad, right? He just wasn't ready to talk about it yet. I tried to avoid charity as much as possible, but this wasn't always easy as we went to the same school. It wasn't like I was scared of her or anything. It was just awkward. Then one day, I walked along the corridor to see flyers stuck to lockers, doors, windows, and floating around the floor. They all had a picture of my face on them, and scrawled across them was, This fraud is the product of her cheating mom and a married man. Everyone was giving me dirty looks and whispering about me. I panicked and rushed out of there, but I wasn't looking where I was going and bumped straight into a jock, and standing next to him was Charity. Enjoy the fame. These flyers were specially made for you. Right at that moment, my father appeared holding a flyer. He waved it in front of her. What is this? Who allows you to trash the school with this rubbish? Leave Teresa alone. I couldn't cope with my father right now, so I ran off to class. That afternoon, I heard the school speaker announce that everything written on the flyers was lies and Charity would be in detention. Once the last bell rang, I just wanted to get home and hide away from the world. But as I walked outside, I saw my dad waiting for me at the gate. I had nothing to say to him, so I ignored him and walked off. Please, Teresa, at least hear me out. I stopped on the spot, then walked over to him. I guess it was time I found out the truth. So, turns out, yes, I'm not his daughter. But I wasn't Uncle Alfred's daughter either. I found this, and it made me feel so guilty, he said. He showed me an artificial insemination certificate file. Turns out after years of trying, my parents went to run some tests, and my dad was diagnosed as infertile. Mom didn't want him to be upset, so she secretly got artificial insemination and gave birth to me. It was never your mom's fault, and I was wrong to treat you like that. I'm, I'm so sorry. 
a fresh ran of tears streamed down my face with each word I heard from him. Teresa, I'm so sorry that us adults' selfishness and bitterness has hurt you. Startled, I turned around to find that Uncle Alfred was already there behind me. I guess he'd come to pick me up, and I didn't notice since I was talking to my dad. He must have heard the whole story. Alfred and I will do anything to make it up to you. Even if you want to find your biological dad, we'll try our best. I looked at him and Uncle Alfred, thinking, There's no need to, as I've already got two amazing dads. Blue sky, white clouds, golden sand. Such a perfect day for sunbathing on this luxury Hawaiian beach while being served by Kirby, my arch enemy. That brat used to tease me all the time about my old clothes and messy hair. Little did she know, I was secretly a millionaire. Earth to Clarine. Castle building all day won't fill your stomach. Finish your shift and go home. Well, Mary, who doesn't want to get rich? Sadly, some of us can only dream about it. If you want to be Cinderella, then go find yourself a prince. Just not Danny. He's just as poor as us. Do not underestimate my Danny. My precious heart fell for him for a reason. It's just that he doesn't seem to realize that we're destined for each other yet. But Mary was right. My dinner won't cook itself. Let's see what we can afford for tonight. My dad left us when I was four. And since then, mom worked her socks off to provide for us. So it was down to me to also work to save up for my law school dream. All of a sudden, groceries started raining down on me. Bottles tumbled off the shelves and broke into pieces right by my feet. Ah, is it an earthquake? I stooped down and prayed until it stopped. Thankfully, no one was hurt, but geez, it sure left a freaking mess. Warren, the store owner, looked distraught. This place was all he had, so I helped him clean up and place anything undamaged back on the shelves. Before you leave, please take this as a token of my gratitude. I hope it brings you luck. A lottery ticket? I don't know how this game works. I'll show you, it's simple. Each ticket has a unique set of numbers. Just check the results on TV tonight and see if they match. Let me see, your numbers are 15, 26, 14, 48, 07, 23. Hey, those are the lucky numbers that have been on my mind all day. I want that ticket. Kirby, stop poking your nose in my business, will you? Sorry, miss, that's the last ticket today, and I already gave it to Clarine. Then I'll buy it. Here's your two bucks. Give it to me. You wish. I didn't really care about this ticket, but there's no way I was going to let her get what she wanted. And surely, she wouldn't leave me alone. How about ten bucks? That's a fortune to the likes of you. No thanks. I'd rather win millions instead and make you my maid. Look, you'll never get anything from me, be it this ticket or Danny. Just give up. Fine! Let me skip this stupid ticket, but Danny, never! Why are we always bickering, you ask? Well, we're both competing for the heart of Danny. Tennis extraordinaire and brooding Adonis. Actually, I thought I had more advantage as he worked part-time at the same restaurant. But nope, Danny was such a cold fish. I tried again and again, but every single time, he just gave me a soulless thank you and that's it. If only I could build him his own tennis courts, perhaps he'd change his attitude. But that's impossible for a poor girl like me, unless I somehow hit the jackpot. The lucky numbers today are 48, 07, 15. Should I add winning the lottery to my daydream list? <laughs> 26, 14. Is it just me or do those numbers sound familiar? No way, it can't be. And the mega ball is 23. Now if your ticket has all six numbers, you win over 20 million dollars. Play on. Me. I think I just become a millionaire. God had answered my prayers. What? Kirby's here too? The ticket must have hit it for real. I rush there to rummage through the trash. And ah, here it is. It's mine. As if. Let's go ask Warren who this ticket belongs to then. Brilliant. And then give him a third of the prize? Do you really expect him not to ask for a share? Right. Okay, let it go and I'll give you a 30% share. Great ratio, but 30% is a perfect fit for you. I'll take 70%. And Danny. Oh, that's how you want to play. Fine then. How about whoever wins Danny's heart gets 70%? Deal. So we agreed to hide the lottery ticket in a trunk with two locks. Each of us kept one key to it. Then we buried it in a bush at school. 
Looks like the secret race between us starts now. Kirby wasted no time and brought Danny the showiest lunches ever. But he kept up his cold exterior and barely acknowledged her. Seems like I need a more delicate approach. So I told Mary to arrange a team building game among the restaurant staff, in which we all had to answer the same questions to understand one another better. Oh look! He liked watching Star Trek, listening to Sam Smith, and reading Harry Potter like me! Oh Danny boy, I told you we were destined to be a pair! Next question, what is the key to maintaining a long-term relationship? There's our very first answer. Feelings? Come on, Danny, be realistic. What uses do feelings have if you can even afford to go on a date? Poor people can also be happy in love, but I don't think pragmatic people like you can. No, no, he misunderstood what I meant. After that, he ignored me completely. Worse still, Kooky Kirby never left him alone. She even brought the whole cheerleading team to do this ridiculous routine while he was playing. Who cheers on a tennis court? She was going big, so I needed to step up my game. It's time to bust out my college savings. I spent the whole day at the mall buying him gifts and giving myself a makeover. This is the first time in my life I've spent my hard-earned money without considering the price. It feels so good, but at the same time, kind of bad. But I could make it up with the lottery money once I got Danny's heart. Look, I saw this watch and I immediately thought of you. I even met a professional tennis player at the mall. Can you believe it? And they told me this racket is the best. What do you think? You're crazy. This costs thousands. Why are you doing this? Um, that's not the reaction I was expecting. But I like you, Danny. I've not been brave enough to tell you this because I had nothing. But soon, my life would change and I can give you everything. I don't need those things. You're so wasteful and superficial. You really think money can buy anything, including feelings? Why was he so mad at me? I thought he must have noticed that I'd worked really hard for all this and even made myself look prettier for him. Okay, he might not like my gifts, but is it so bad that I want to be a little generous to myself now that I have some money? Things got even worse when later I arrived at work to see Kirby booking out the entire restaurant to let her Danny take a rest and enjoy dinner with her. Fine, you win Kirby, I give up. <sighs> Nothing, basically nothing went the way I wanted. My luck, my money, my man. Now I'm fine with just the 30% God gave me. I'm done chasing anyone. Only my stray friends understand me. Muffin, Brownie, Oreo. Wait, where's Cupcake? Looking for him? Let him go. This wasteful superficial girl needs to make sure he's not starving. So you're the one who feeds them every day? Why do you care? Go back to your date with Kirby. I'm just a materialist who thinks money solves everything. I'm sorry for how I acted earlier. It's just that, at home, I'm surrounded by people who are all about money. So I hate that way of life. Why are you talking like you come from money or something? Yeah, kinda. My parents are the presidents of Sunland Corp. What? The biggest furniture corporation in the city? Unbelievable! So why are you working part-time at a restaurant? I want to earn my own money. An independent life suits me much better. You're so silly. Why struggle if you don't have to? If I were you, my life would be so different. I'd make sure that my mom didn't need to work all the time to make ends meet. I could even go to any expensive law school I want and care for all the stray cats and dogs I find. Surprisingly, this time, Danny didn't look at me with jaded eyes like before. Instead, he just listened patiently and gave me the sweetest smile ever. But not love. That's one thing money can't buy. H how about Kirby? Did any of her grand gestures impress you? <laughs> I prefer the cats. Our talk has confirmed that there's still a chance for me. Kirby's only advantage over me is money, but Danny doesn't care about that anyway. Is that the new student? Seems like Danny just found a worthy opponent. He's Finn. Look how he smiles whenever his opponent catches up a point. Wait, did you just call Danny someone's opponent? Someone has a new crush. Who? who? Don't talk nonsense! Right then, a ball zoomed toward us! And holy moly, Finn caught it just mere inches from Kirby's face! Are you okay? She's fine, her face always turns red. Nothing to do with a ball. Kirby was so embarrassed that she ran off. <laughs> it seems our race took a turn. But then, shockingly, Finn turned to me and asked for my number? Huh? Does my charm glow this much? Everyone knew I liked Danny. But he's such a riddle. Hmm, maybe I could use Finn as my last card to make Danny jealous and bait Kirby to give up on our deal. What a genius I am! 
Then, for the next few days, whenever Danny was around, I flirted with Finn and made sure Kirby saw us. One day, I made an excuse to borrow Finn's phone, then I secretly used it to send Danny a message to stir up his jealousy. If you don't like Clarine, then let me play with this innocent girl for a bit. And Kirby also needs a kick to admit her feelings as well, right? Actually, I like you. Looking into your eyes, I know you also have feelings for me, so… And finally, I set a date for them at the tennis court tonight at 8. If Danny doesn't want me to get hurt and Kirby doesn't want to miss her true love, they'll show up. Then I covered up my tracks, blocked both our numbers, and returned his phone. Thank you so much! Are you free tonight? Come to the tennis court. I have something important to tell you. Oh god, Finn looks like he just won the Wimbledon! That night, Finn got there early and was really excited. Let's see who will raise the curtain. Ah, it's Kirby. Oh, Finn, you had me at hello. But admitting my feelings means I lose the deal with Clarine, so… What do you mean? What deal? No, no, don't get me wrong. Actually, we won the lottery and made a deal to share it. Anyways, silly me. Money can compare to you. Lottery? You two share it? Why did she even mention the money? Right when it's getting messy, Danny turned up. Bastard! Now you're two-timing? Danny, why are you here? He's just playing with you. This jerk is seeing both you and Kirby. Don't let him fool you. I think Finn is a nice guy. Plus, I've told you how I felt, but you've never seemed to like me back. So Finn, we… Finn told me he liked me! Clarine, I like you. More than you know. Can't you see? I've given a lot of… hints. I always make excuses to go home with you. I told you that feelings were the most important thing to me, as in my feelings for you. Really? Idiot. How am I supposed to pick up those hints? So this daydreamer wasn't just imagining things? Turns out my plan actually did succeed. Kirby, it's true. I do like you. But I thought you were out of my league, so I just wanted to ask Clarine for help. Oh, how nice. Kirby, with a huge grin, then admitted I won. Then she dragged Finn away. Hmm, I guess my biggest win is successfully pairing up two couples. The next morning, Kirby and I opened the trunk to get the ticket, when to our utter shock, Finn swooped in and snatched it away. While we were still processing what was going on, he ran off with our millions. But then, a shadow sent him tumbling to the ground. Danny? I saw him following you two and knew he was up to something shady. Then, Finn confessed that he transferred schools and approached me for the lottery ticket following his dad's order, who's none other than… Warren! He knew it was a jackpot winning ticket, so he set up a plan to steal it from me. I'm so sorry. My dad's a gambling addict, which left him heavily in debt, and only this ticket could save him. Oh, Finn. I believe he's not a bad person. This ticket was originally from Warren anyway, so we both agreed to give him a share to pay off his debt. Finn was moved and handed the ticket back to us. On learning this, Warren thanked us and offered to drive us to Tallahassee to claim our prize. He even carefully got me to double check that my ticket was in my purse. But halfway there, the car suddenly broke down, so the four of us got out and gave it a push. But as we started pushing, Warren suddenly sped away, leaving all of us standing there in shock. Where's your purse, Clarine? I left it in the car. That greedy snake Warren did this on purpose to run away with the ticket! Now what to do? Walk back home or walk to Tallahassee? Calm down. Danny already has a backup plan. This is the real ticket. Enjoy the view for now. A taxi is coming to pick us up. Actually, the moment Warren offered to drive us all the way to Tallahassee, I sent something sketchy. So I swapped the tickets. <sighs> My dad's gone too far this time. He needs to stop gambling and work hard to pay off his debts instead. Finally, we got the cash prize. However, the four of us decided not to divide it anymore. Instead, we're building a shelter for stray animals together. Surprisingly, our project soon reached many philanthropists and now our fund has been expanded across the US. Since then, Kirby is no longer obnoxious. Now she even wants to become a veterinarian. And me? I will continue to work my way into the law school of my dreams. My hard work has really paid off because they just sent me an acceptance letter. I might not be rich, but in all honesty, it doesn't matter, as I couldn't be happier. Hey, what's with the long face? Oh, 
Hey, it, it's nothing, just a bad day. You know, you can tell me everything, right? I'm your best friend, so I know when something is up with you. Spit it out. Okay, you're right, as always. <laughs> I think you should hang on to something, because this is shocking news. I- Oh? My god. Who is that? He looks so gorgeous. Sue, are you even listening? Huh? What did you just say? I turned to him, but he mumbled out typical, then walked away. Jeez, what's his problem? Oh, that was Lucas earlier. My best friend since kindergarten. Don't mind him, he's always like this. But whatever, let's get back to this handsome guy. So it turns out his name is Alex, and he's new here. I knew it, because such a pretty boy like him would never go unnoticed by me. The next morning, I couldn't wait to walk to school with Lucas. I had some amazing news to tell him. It happened to me the night before, during my shift at the diner. Lucas, you won't believe who was in the diner yesterday. Robert Downey Jr.? What? No, it was Alex, the new student. Gosh, Lucas, you've got to help me get his attention. You're on the baseball team together, right? Huh? Do you like that guy? Seriously? Duh. I mean, look at him. He's like Timothy Chalamet's twin brother. So will you help me, please? Ugh, fine. Hmm. I did hear him say he likes girls on roller skates. I have an idea. The next time he comes to the diner, serve him on skates. It's a sure way to impress him. Oh, yes, that's a great idea. I hugged Lucas to thank him. So the next time Alex came into the diner, I took out my roller skates and was ready to serve him his spaghetti. I'm kind of a novice on skates, so I slowly slid over to him. So far, so good until I didn't see that somebody had spilled their milkshake all over the floor. And yes, of course, I slipped. Oh no! I quickly covered my head to avoid the spaghetti plate, but... Huh? The plate had fallen on the floor, but where was the spaghetti? I looked around. Oh, snap! I found it! It landed on Alex's head! It was so humiliating. But worse still, as hard as I tried, I couldn't get back on my feet. Ugh, stupid skates. I repeatedly apologized to him. At first, Alex looked totally shocked. Then, perhaps because of my pathetic look, he couldn't hold it in anymore and burst out laughing. <laughs> well, at least you dare to slide on them. I, on the other hand, am not a big fan of those. <laughs> what? What did he mean by that? Ugh, Lucas! The next day, I went looking for Lucas to confront him. He was easy to find, as he was in his favorite place to browse in town, the sneaker store. Why did you tell me Alex likes roller skates? Because he definitely doesn't. <laughs> Maybe I misheard him. Oh, wait, he likes girls in superhero costumes. That's right. What? That sounds ridiculous. Forget it, I'm not listening to you anymore. Go give your advice to some other poor girl, not me. What's up with Lucas? Why would he give me such bad advice? It's like he wanted me to fail. But why? Oh my goodness. Was he, maybe, into me? Nah, nonsense. Still, I had a feeling about it. So I decided to avoid Lucas as much as possible. I came up with loads of excuses not to hang out with him. Such as mom was driving me to school, and I was skipping lunch because I was on a diet. Ugh, it was so exhausting. I mean, have you ever tried sneakily eating your lunch in class so you don't pass out from hunger? However, this was necessary, as we both needed some space. It's the only way to keep our friendship safe. But then one day, Lucas messaged me. Can we talk after school? I have something important to tell you. Oh no. Was he going to confess his feelings? But if he did it, our friendship would be ruined. I couldn't let that happen, so I didn't meet him. Instead, I ran straight home. He called me a bunch of times, but I ignored them all. I ghosted him, to be exact. Jeez, I wasn't proud, but I had to save our friendship from stupid Cupid. But then the next time I saw him, he only gave me a hurt look, then purposely walked off in the other direction. Oh, no. Now it was basically like a cold war between us. Ugh. We might not have been hanging out with each other, but I was still keeping an eye on Lucas. I'd been watching him for a couple of days, and it looked like he was having a tough time. He must have figured out my rejection, so now he was miserable. Oh, dear Lucas, I didn't want this to happen, but I can't risk losing our friendship. 
But then I noticed something. One time, the whole school went on a picnic trip. I watched Lucas from afar and noticed that he was giving dagger looks to a bunch of girls. Hmm, hang on. They were surrounding Alex. I even saw him trip another girl up who was going to join the group of girls adoring Alex. And then he made out it was an accident. Another time, I overheard him telling girls from other classes who were standing by the class door trying to get a glimpse of Alex that he pretended to be all cold and quiet because he had hideous teeth. Which, of course, wasn't true, because he had a smile that could light up a room. Uh, looks like it wasn't just me. Lucas didn't want any other girls going near Alex. Did he hate Alex that much? Or, or, he likes Alex? For heaven's sake! Stop thinking such nonsense, Sue! Your head was messing with you. Then one day, my mom heard that Lucas's mom was sick, so she made some chicken soup and told me to bring it over to his mom. I didn't want to go around there. I mean, what if I saw Lucas? Awkward. But who was I to deny a sick lady soup? When I arrived, I opened the door and let myself in as I usually do. And that's when I heard the conversation between Lucas and his mom. Lucas, do you need to forget about Alex? I want to, but I can't, mom. He's always on my mind. <sighs> anyway, the important thing is your health. You need to eat something. Look at you, you're not getting any better. How can I eat after your dad left us? It's like all this time I've been living in a lie. I'm so sorry. Wait a moment. My Sherlock Holmes intuition was kicking in. Now everything makes sense. Why Lucas was sad for a couple of days, why I hadn't seen his dad for a while, and why his mom was suddenly sick. It's because Lucas was gay. His father probably didn't take it so well, so he left, which was really devastating for Lucas's mom. But I'm his best friend. Why didn't he tell me? Man... He hid it really well. But not only that, he also tried to sabotage me when he knew I had a crush on Alex. Well, it turns out we weren't best friends like I thought. Ugh. But no, I couldn't just ignore this. I needed to talk to Lucas to clear things up. The next day, Lucas had baseball practice. So I went to find him at the field, but he wasn't there. I asked some of his teammates, but nobody knew where he was. Hmm, where could he have gone? And that's when I saw Lucas. With Alex. Behind the bleachers. Well, well, well. Look at them. A lovey-dovey. They talked for a bit, then each of them walked away in a different direction. I watched them from a distance with my arms folded. That traitor! I was so ready to yell in Lucas's face. And that's when our eyes met. He was startled when he saw me. Like he'd just been busted. Well, it was technically the correct word to describe the situation. Sue, Su Su what are you doing here? Why do you look so flustered? Come on, I know about your relationship between you and Alex, so you don't need to hide it anymore. <laughs> How did you know about it? I heard you and your mom talking about it, but I don't understand. How could you do this to me? You knew that I liked Alex. I know, but I couldn't explain. I was so ashamed. You should have talked to me first, but instead you stole Alex from me. Best friends don't do that to each other. Hold on a minute. What did you just say? I stole Alex from you? What do you mean? Ugh, come on. Just stop with all this hiding and lying. I know you two are together. What? Why was he overreacting like this? Was what I just said not true? Well, turns out it wasn't. I was totally wrong. Just one thing was for sure. My detective intuition sucked. And that's when Lucas told me the truth. Lucas and Alex weren't in love. Lucas even hated Alex because he's Lucas's half-brother. Oh my. It's like I got lost in a telenovela or something. When my mom was pregnant with me, my dad got drunk and made a big mistake with a colleague of his. She fell pregnant with Alex, but my dad didn't know about it. Then a month ago... Alex's mom was diagnosed with a serious illness. She didn't want him to end up alone if she couldn't make it. So she showed up in dad's life again and messed everything up. Oh my god. So that's why Lucas's mom all of a sudden got so skinny and sick. And Lucas's dad didn't leave them. No, it's because his mom kicked his dad out of the house. I wanted to tell you in the canteen the other day, but you were too starry-eyed over Alex to listen. This made me mad, so I tried everything to prevent you from getting close to him. My family's broken because of him, so I don't want my best friend to fall for someone like that. Ugh. Oh, it turns out, I'm a really bad friend. My best friend had problems at home, and I didn't even know it. No, because I was busy daydreaming about a guy I barely knew. I apologized to Lucas, and promised that I would pay more attention to him. And then we hugged. On the plus side... At least none of my crazy theories were true. <laughs> so it turns out it was all just one big misunderstanding. 
The Cold War between us ended, and our friendship remains as amazing as ever. I also managed to convince Lucas and Alex to give each other a chance. After all, they're half-brothers, and what happened between their parents wasn't their fault. Besides, Alex's mom is seriously ill, so he needs Lucas more than ever. It's great hanging out with them both and seeing them laughing and joking about. Ah, peace at last. The three of us have become pretty great friends. Oh, do you want to hear something funny? Lucas actually offered to matchmake me with Alex. <laughs> but it's okay. I refused. Why, you ask? Well, the three of us are such awesome friends now, and I don't want anything to ruin that. Pretty mature of me, right? <laughs> It's the country's fair day today, or as I like to call it, my winning day. See that huge plushie over there? It's about to become mine. Ready, set, and yes, bullseye! I excitedly took the bear when it suddenly got yanked away by this crazy bull. Hey, I won that bear fair and square, but I saw it first. Now hand it over, hobbit. Hobbit? I yanked the bear from him, but it ended up ripping in half. His girlfriend burst into tears, and now I'm like a red rag to him. He rushed towards me, and before I could even think straight, my fist took over. How many times have I told you, Angie? A girl doesn't just raise her fist and cause trouble like that. It was self-defense. He was gonna hit me, Mom. I'm done with this. Like father, like daughter. Why are you even bringing him up? He left us years ago, so let him stay out of our lives. Even thinking about him made my blood boil. I turned to the window, avoiding the look I knew my mom was giving me. When we got home, we found the door open. Something wasn't right. I quickly ran into the house and saw black shadows standing in our living room. Who are you people? What are you doing in my house? All hail our new leader! The lights suddenly came back on, and I saw them all bow to... me? Angelina, I've been looking forward to meeting you. I'm Nick Mason, Mr. Bruno's right-hand man. My dad sent you here? From this day on, you will become our new leader of the X organization on his behalf. You gotta be kidding me. For so many years, he hasn't cared about whether we live or die, and now he suddenly wants me to take over? And look at you all. This organization seems no good. Please don't misunderstand us. X organization was founded by your father to help the local people and fight for justice. But things took a horrible turn, so I'm afraid he's gone to jail for a little while. He's in jail? Oh, my head. Fighting for justice? That's why he's in jail now? Your father put the safety of the seaport local first. In doing so, he fell into the enemy's trap. You will understand him better if you accept his wish and become our leader. As much as I hate to admit it, I missed my dad. He once promised that he would skip his work and hang out with me on my birthday, but then he just disappeared without a word and has been quiet for the past six years. Until now. Darling, I have something for you. She gave me some old letters and a plushie bear, which I'd begged my dad to buy for me. She'd hid it from me the whole time, as she was mad at my dad for always risking his life for things that weren't any of his business. It turned out that my dad had still cared about me, even without me knowing. Mom, I've made up my mind. I hope you'll support me. So, my mom and I had a long journey to the seaport of the city where my dad's ex-organization was secretly operating. We walked into the market, then stopped at a large fish shop. How on earth does an organization have their secret base in such a crowded place? The most dangerous place is the safest one. Remember that. I remembered my dad used to say this to me when I was a kid too. This must be his crazy idea. Nick led me into a room at the back of the store and introduced this as the organization's base. So, this is where my dad used to work, and he'd still kept the same old hat all these years? Let's get to work. There's been a lot of theft going on in town lately. Every night, the thieves break into stores and steal everything they can. People are panicking right now, so we need to solve this as soon as possible. Isn't this the police's responsibility? If they were capable, we wouldn't have to get involved. That's why your father maintains this organization. Now you need to settle in a bit. I've arranged your accommodation and enrolled you in a local school. Remember, your identity is top secret. For the next few days, at 5 a.m. every morning, Uncle Nick got me up and took me to the port to tell me more about the thieves. However, he just joined the fish auction the whole morning instead of actually doing anything serious. So, I went somewhere else and pretended to talk to the fishmongers about the burglaries in town. At that moment, a guy in a cap that covered his face bumped into me. Hey, dude, nice bracelet, but ever taught to apologize? Hey, hey, take it easy. You're making a scene. Okay? 
Maybe I should just behave like a normal schoolgirl here. Having to get up so early in the morning to go to the port also made me too exhausted to study anything. One morning I was falling asleep at my usual place when some noise woke me up. A group of gangsters was teasing a boy? Dude, I'm trying to catch some shut-eye over here. Shut up, loser. Uh-oh, they were messing with the wrong person. I grabbed a nearby mop and made some fancy moves that took them all down, then dragged the flabbergasted nerd out of there. He wasn't calm enough to run for his life. This little guy is Killian. Ever since that day, he kept following me and wouldn't shut up about how strong I was, saying things like, I could never imagine a small person like you having such crazy strength. Or, they all pick on me, but you, Angel, don't. Then, let's be friends. I have no peace when he's around. While I was trying to make some space for myself, a call suddenly came from Uncle Nick. One of the jewelry shops in the city just got burglarized. Can you help? What? Yeah, I'll head back to headquarters and set up a plan. You can count on me. I then hung up, and that's when I heard a ball hitting the floor. I turned around, and there was Killian, standing behind me, shocked to the core. He'd obviously heard the whole conversation. If you utter a word of this to anyone, you'll not wake to see another day. Do you hear me? I... I can help you. I know this town like the back of my hand. Okay, we can be friends. Or associates. As long as you keep quiet. After school, Killian and I rushed to the crime scene. While wandering around, I spotted a shiny thing among the broken glass. It must have been from those thieves. But wait, I've seen this D symbol somewhere. I was about to pick it up when Killian grabbed my hand, shivering. Bro, it's her who attacked us back then. That gangster suddenly came at me. I tried to dodge him, but ended up toppling over backwards. Suddenly, a strong arm held me back and shielded me from the punch. Mamma mia! Who's this handsome hunk? I wrapped my arms around him and pulled out my inner damsel in distress. Oh, my hero! These jerks won't leave me alone! Please save me! I'm scared! Mess with my friend one more time and you're dead meat. Get lost! He turned to me, making sure I was okay, then parted way. Through Killian, I found out his name is Frank a senior at our school, and he's known for his cold and reserved demeanor. Definitely my type of guy. But wait, what about the bracelet? I returned to the broken glass window. The bracelet was nowhere to be found. At school, all students were constantly talking about these recent burglaries. Everyone was worried about who would be the next victim. When will all this nonsense stop? I wonder who their next target will be. Don't you see? The reason victims were all the big shots in town, and the crimes were all on the days the police weren't out patrolling. So then, Graham's jewelry shop and Holden's boutique store could potentially be their next target? That makes sense! Uh, wait, Frank? Now that you're here, I feel so much safer. It'll probably be Holden's because Graham already added a new security system to his shop. Please stop fiddling with your hair like that. Good observation. The police don't patrol the port tonight, so they might make a move. So stay still inside, will you, sweetie? Aww. But his sweetie still gotta watch Holden's shop and catch the thieves red-handed tonight. An hour had already passed, but nothing had happened. Right at that moment, Nick received a phone call that Graham's shop had just been robbed. The thieves broke the security system and everything had been taken. Nick snapped at me for acting impulsively without having any clear evidence. But this felt so sketchy, though. Holden's store was way more vulnerable. It's like they knew we were waiting to ambush them here. A few days later, while I was patrolling around the shopping street, Killian informed me that there was a suspicious masked man sneaking around the pearl shop. I immediately dashed there, right at the moment he was breaking the lock. In the blink of an eye, I kicked him, knocking him to the ground. Angelina! Holy crickets, are you okay? I looked up to see Frank running towards me. The thief immediately rose up, causing me to fall back, then fled the scene right away. Catch the thief, quick! Frank and Killian darted past me and followed the guy. I waited for them at the harbor, but only Killian came back. Oh, sorry, Angelina, but I have to say this. There's something fishy about Frank. I think he's on the thief's side. Oh, come on. Are you jealous of him? How do I know you're not their spy? What do you mean? You've been acting suspicious from the get-go. You wouldn't leave me alone for a sec. And remember how you listened in on my conversation with Nick? And what about when you made me so sure it was Holden Chop that would be the next target, hmm? And now you're blaming Frank? You're so wrapped up in that jerk. 
I saw him purposefully let that thief go. When I was about to catch up to him, Frank suddenly stopped, making me crash into him, then the thief got away. That, that can't be. He's always there to help me. I'm the one who's always backing you up, but you only see that fraud as your hero. Ugh, just forget it. Wait, I, I had no idea who to trust. It was all so confusing. Right at that moment, I got a message from Frank asking me to go to this meteor camping place, as he had something important to say to me. Okay, it was time to confront him and get the truth. I rushed there as fast as I could, only to find… nobody? I looked around and noticed this suspiciously lit up tent. The tent flap suddenly opened, and a shadow bolted towards me. Hey, hey, calm down, it's me. I opened my eyes to see Frank in front of me. He'd set up this whole place for me? Frank suddenly took my hand and confessed. Angelina, I've fallen head over heels for you. I was wondering, will you be my girlfriend? Together, we could be a power couple. With your ex-organization and my Darkwalkers clan backing us, how do you know I'm related to ex-organization? Huh, <laughs> I've been watching you since that first day you wandered around the fish market with that old Nick. <laughs> Remember this bracelet? You almost got me that time. You... You shameless, rotten, stinking skunk! I even trusted you over Killian! Oh, come on. It's not my fault you fell for me and betrayed your best friend. You and I are more alike than you think. It's only fitting that we become a team. Enough! Listen carefully. I'm never going to team up with a dirtbag like you! H how did you- Guys, take her! From the tents, Frank's minions came out one by one and surrounded me, then gradually tightened the siege. Let's see who's the boss now. Oh, no, 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 I fell into his trap. Those punks held a rope, ready to tie me up. But right at that moment, I heard a car engine approaching. Is that Killian leading Nick and the X organization? He jumped out of the car, ran past the minions and Frank to get to me. Angelina, are you all right? You're not hurt anywhere, are you? I shook my head and felt so touched. He'd come to save me. I thought you were mad at me. I was, a little bit, but I couldn't let you do all this alone, so I went to Uncle Nick. Behind Killian, Uncle Nick and the team had seized all the thieves and their ringleader Frank. Now they'd spill all their dirty secrets in front of the law. It turns out, my dad was about to expose the Darkwalker clan for their evil antics when they framed him for intentionally causing injury and put him behind bars. Since I became the new leader of X, Frank had been trying to seduce me so he could manipulate the organization. Finally though, my dad was found innocent and released. Mom and I welcomed him home with open arms. I'm so sorry for leaving you behind. I was afraid I would put you in danger. It's alright dad, you must have had a hard time too. I'm sorry for taking so long to realize how proud I am of you. I missed you so much. Dad was super impressed with what we had accomplished for the organization. He even decided to let me continue to be the leader, all the while supporting me and teaching me his tricks. And I know for sure everything will turn out okay, especially with this guy by my side. So, did I do a good job proving myself, lady boss? The vice leader position seems to suit me well, don't you think? Hmm, you do deserve a promotion. How does vice leader and boyfriend sound? Hi guys, it's me, Claire. So tomorrow is gonna be super exciting. I'm putting my life in your hands, literally, as I'm gonna be doing a My Instagram Followers Control My Day video. Yay! Most influencers do this with options, but I trust you guys, so go wild. Just visit my Instagram, like this video, and comment on whatever you want me to do tomorrow. The comments with the most likes will be chosen, and don't forget to follow me to stay updated. As you can see, I'm Claire, and I'm a beauty influencer on Instagram. Of course, with this pretty face and eye for style, I already have loads of followers. But for someone who was born to be famous like me, that's not enough. That's why I'm doing this viral challenge. It'll get me tens of thousands of likes. Okay, that's it for today. Now I better get my beauty sleep. Gotta have glowing skin tomorrow. The first thing to do in the morning was to check my Instagram. 20,000 likes from my post last night. That's average. Let's see. I asked my followers to decide what I should wear and what I should eat for breakfast. 
and the most liked comments were about Y2K style and avocado toast. My favorite dish anyway. Easy peasy. I called the maid to prepare breakfast while I did my skincare routine. Then I made sure I took a cute selfie and uploaded it to my story. What a good start. Am I the cutest girl on earth or what? Okay, now I have to make a very difficult decision. Which bag best compliments my outfit? This one or this one? I was still trying to decide when my phone rang. Ugh, that's Liam, my boyfriend. It's so early, yet he's already sent me a ton of messages. What are you doing? Why didn't you reply to any of my texts? Hurry up if you don't want to be late for school. All right, all right, I'm coming. Jeez, why does he have to be so stressy? It doesn't matter if we're a little late. I mean, come on, it's only school. After choosing the right bag, I got into Liam's car. He frowned at me and asked me what took so long. I was busy taking selfies. I replied and posted a mirror selfie I took earlier on my Instagram with the caption, Y2K style for today. What should I do at school this morning? At break time, I was sitting in the cafeteria with Liam and my bestie, Tori. As usual, my beauty was attracting attention. All eyes were on me, and one guy even gushed out, You're so pretty, Claire. <laughs> I checked my Instagram to see how my newly posted pic was doing. Oh, it already had 50,000 likes. That's good, but I know with my charisma, I can do even better. But, huh? What's this? The most liked comment on the post wants me to go to the school library and scream, I hate studying and the library is the most boring place on earth. What kind of request is this? Don't do it. I don't have a good feeling about this. It could be from someone who's trying to sabotage you. Liam has a point. This could just be a trick that Isabella, my rival at school, devised to embarrass me. She's also an influencer on Instagram, but she just copies everything I do. Her Instagram is 5,000 followers less than mine. Yawn. But Claire, how are you going to explain to your followers if you bail out? I don't think they'd be happy about it. Hmm, right. I'm doing a challenge, aren't I? Can't stop after only two comments, especially because one from anti-fan. Besides, this is no big deal, right? Who even goes to the library anymore? So, I dragged Liam and Tori to the library. As you know, I need them to film me. Huh? Why was it so ridiculously busy in here? Since when did people actually want to study? I needed to get this over with. So breaking through the silence, I shouted, I hate studying, and the library is the most boring place on earth. All eyes instantly fell on me and I heard tuts and grunts. Then someone said, What the hell are you doing? Ugh, why is everyone in here so serious? I just shrugged and walked away. At least Liam and Tori had captured me at my best angle. To my surprise, that video gained me a load of views and likes, and I even earned nearly 1,000 more followers. Who would have thought that such a silly act would get so popular? At that moment, Isabella walked past me. Only brainless people would scream in the library. Huh, look who's jealous now. Hey, you might as well try that. Maybe you'll get half of my followers. Isabella looks like she's about to explode with anger. <laughs> but then she sneered and said, Let's see if you're still laughing after you see what you've got to do next. Huh? What is she on about? I immediately opened my Insta to check. What? The top comment this time was from Isabella. She wants me to put a trash bag on my head and go to the mall. Ew, trash bag? I spent an hour styling my hair this morning. Isabella, you wicked witch. But okay, if she wants to play, I'll prove to her that she's messing with the wrong person. Just like last time, Liam tried to talk me out of it. This is nonsense, Claire. Don't lower yourself to this level just for a few likes. I told him he was overreacting, and that I wasn't going to let my followers down by bottling out of it. This seemed to annoy him, and he stormed off. 
Um, so who's going to take videos for me? I called out, but Liam just kept walking. Why can't he just support me like usual? Luckily, I still had Tori, and she agreed to film it for me. That's what best friends are for. Okay, this is more embarrassing than I thought. People keep staring at me like I'm an alien. I gave them a what-are-you-looking-at stare, prompting them to quickly turn away. No, I have to act confidently for the video to get more likes. Looking over, I saw Tori cheering me on, so I took a deep breath, stood up straight, and did my best catwalk strut through the mall. My heart was pounding like crazy, even after we walked out of the mall. Phew, it was finally over. I then quickly opened up my Insta, uploaded the video I just shot, then texted Liam asking where he was. After that, Tori and I got in a taxi to his house. Liam was already waiting for me at the door, looking all serious when I got there. So I told Tori to wait in the taxi. Then angrily I shouted as I walked over to him, You could have at least come and supported me. Do you know how upset I was when you just left like that? I wasn't comfortable filming you make a fool of yourself. I care about you too much. It's just a bit of harmless fun. Why can't you understand how important being an influencer is to me? <sighs> I don't think I can be with someone who doesn't support me and my passion anymore. We should break up. Then I just walked away, not giving Liam a chance to explain. He quickly ran over and grabbed my hand. Okay, I'm sorry. Can we talk it out? <laughs> it worked! I gestured to Tori, then turned around with a big smile at Liam. Can you believe the followers want me to test your love by pretending to break up with you? I'll show them how much you love me. But then, unexpectedly, Liam angrily shouted, What? So, I'm just another tool to get likes for your Instagram? If you want to break up, then fine, we're done. Then he stormed into his house and slammed the door. I stood there open-mouthed. How could he break up with me? In the whole two years we've been together, I've never seen him this mad. I'll let him chill for a bit and talk to him tomorrow. He'll have calmed down by then. Right? Look, Claire! Your shopping mall video has already reached 100,000 likes! Oh my god, what is this? People are going crazy for my videos. They say I'm so confident, wearing a trash bag and still looking stylish. I look like Kendall Jenner. And my followers also increased by 5,000 people. At least this is worth the effort I put in. The next morning, I waited for Liam to pick me up. But he never arrived. When I got to school, I tracked him down and asked if he was still mad at me. You're so addicted to social media. I don't even know who you are anymore. Then he walked off. At that exact moment, Isabella walked towards me. Wait, why is Tori with her? Hey, loser, you're in so much trouble. What does that mean? I looked at Tori in confusion, but she just lowered her head and quickly followed Isabella. Feeling something was wrong, I immediately opened Instagram and... Oh my god, what are these comments? Such an attention seeker. She's willing to do anything just for some likes. I heard that her boyfriend broke up with her. No surprises there. <laughs> what is this? I did all these things at their requests, and now I'm the one receiving all the hate? Suddenly, the principal announced via the loudspeaker that I had to go to his office. As I walked in, I saw my parents sitting there. Turns out, news of what I did at the library had spread. But not only that, someone even accused me of stealing from the shopping mall. Huh? I didn't steal anything. To prove my innocence, I gave the principal my bag to check. And he pulled out a brand new necklace. Why is this thing in my bag? I tried explaining myself, but no one would listen. I was suspended for a week. The walk out of the principal's office was the worst thing ever. Everyone was giving me judging looks and whispering to each other. On the way home, I took a teary selfie and posted it on Instagram with the caption, 
consequences of yesterday's challenge. One week suspension. Someone put the blame on me. Once home, my ashamed-looking parents immediately took my phone away and even disconnected the Wi-Fi. Ugh! My life was over! I ran up to my room in a huff and flopped down onto my bed. Suddenly, my eyes crossed a photo I took with Liam on my birthday last year. That's when Liam threw me a surprise party, and he even made me a cute birthday cake. Come to think of it, I was a bit too harsh with him yesterday. He was only trying to protect me. If I'd listened to him, I wouldn't have all these hate comments and be stuck home for a week. I hurt Liam just to gain more followers. How could I be so stupid? I wished I could apologize to him right now, but... <sighs> then to my surprise, after just three days, my mom told me I was allowed back to school. There were still mutters about me, but that didn't matter, as Liam was waiting for me at my locker. I hurried over to him, apologized, and explained everything. Claire, I know you're the sweetest, most loving girl. You just got carried away with your frivolous Instagram popularity. Besides, I know you're not a thief. Then Liam told me that out of suspicion, he asked to check different CCTV at the shopping mall and discovered that it was Tori who dropped the necklace box into my bag. Turns out, she was only hanging out with me because I was famous and rich. So when Isabella paid her, she turned 180 degrees, running after Isabella and playing tricks on me. Liam reported this to the principal, and now both of them have been suspended. That's it. Chasing after popularity on the internet didn't bring me any real friends but only virtual fans, and a fake friend, sadly. I got blindsided by the likes and followers and overlooked what was truly important, my real-life relationships and the people who genuinely care for me. After that incident, I decided to deactivate my Instagram account for a while, at least until I feel stable again. And even if I lose all my followers, I don't really mind anymore. Because right now, I'm spending time with those who really matter to me. Hey, I'm Kirsty, and I have an identical twin sister called Arabelle. We didn't have a normal upbringing, as our mom abandoned us at an orphanage when we were six. We have our mom's dark blue eyes. That's pretty much all I remember about her. I'm not fully sure why she gave us up. I guess she was young and just couldn't cope. As little kids, my sister and I were close. We used to fool the other kids and the nuns into thinking that we were each other. Arabelle always wore a pink bow in her hair, so we'd both wear one and freak the kids out by double-crossing them in the corridors. Those were good times. But when we got older, everything has changed. I started to become green with envy in Arabelle. Everyone always liked her more than me. The nuns called her Little Cat, and every kid kept surrounding her like she was a sparkling star or something. They all thought she was so sweet and polite. This annoyed me because I knew the real her, and she wasn't sweet at all, if not a completely fake girl. And she just knew exactly what to say and do to get the most from people. Then, when we were 12, a lot had been happening that completely changed our lives. The orphanage had financial problems that could not be saved. Our nuns loved us so much that they didn't want to lose any of us, but they had no choice but to allow the social organization to find us adoptive parents. The nuns didn't want my sister and I to be apart, so they sent us to two families in the same town. But the god of justice must be blind as usual. Arabelle was way luckier than me. She was adopted by a wealthier family. My parents loved me anyway, but, well, she received all the best things, and that was just not fair. We went to the same school, and I was so sick of listening to her bragging. When we were at the orphanage, we used to wear the same kind of clothes, but now things were different. Arabelle always stayed in style wearing the most beautiful clothes. So, while although we are identical twin sisters, whenever we stand next to each other, she would be like a queen and I would be a maid. She easily got everything I ever wished for. 
princess bed, a large window with a sea view, piano and ballet classes, and an amazing mom and dad. She talked about it all the time, and I got sick hearing it. It seemed like all of the greatest things were not enough for her. She didn't appreciate what they gave her and just always wanted more. If I were her, I would enjoy that dream life with gratitude and respect everything I got. Life was so unfair. Why did Arabelle always have the best while a girl like me was suffering from the day I was born? Adopting one part of a twin made our two new families close. My new family was always visiting Arabelle's big house for barbecues and nice dinners. To be honest, I did not want to go there at all. It was not a simple family meeting. It was just an event for her to show up. Her parents were so nice, and just by looking at the way they treated her, I could tell that they loved her so much. They often patted her head and called her puppy. Arabelle acted all sweet. Then, behind their backs, she said this nickname made her feel sick, as she wasn't five. No one seemed to realize the truth. Arabelle was absolutely not as cute as they ever thought. She actually was kind of insolent, haughty, boastful girl, and most of all, she was a fake. I remember one time when her mother's birthday party was taking place. Her mom looked stunning in that gorgeous dress, and people in the room just stayed silent for a while to show their impressing. Arabelle pretended to be cute and gave tons of compliments to her mom, but as soon as her mom turned her back on us, Arabelle whispered to me, Look at her stupid smile. She is thinking that she really is beautiful, while everyone knows that I'm the one who looks stunning here. I was so sick of her double life. She was so lucky living that great life, but she had no appreciation for what she already had. And she was so fake. One time, I tried to unmask her true colors. I tried to tell my parents and our mutual friend about how she'd acted behind their backs, but they never believed me and just told me to stop being mean and selfish. They didn't understand a thing about her real version and even scolded me. I was the one who deserved that life, not that fake loser girl. That was when I decided to make a bigger plan. I wanted to replace Arabelle and live her life. I started staring at her work and copied her handwriting. I practiced imitating her voice. We sounded pretty similar, so this was easy. I secretly followed her and her lame friends at school so that I could learn all about their hobbies and habits. But my family was not as wealthy as theirs. I could only stand outside the restaurant, the clothing store, or the cinema. Watching Arabelle enjoy the good life just made my determination grow. When our families met up, I made an effort to get to know her parents more. Her mom likes playing the piano, and her dad likes taking care of his bonsai trees. Her mom can't eat seafood, and her dad is allergic to peanut butter. I jotted down every little detail about her life in my planning book. There were a lot of things I needed to learn until I was fully confident that I could become a second Arabelle and successfully replace her. But then, something suddenly happened that made me speed up my plan. This boy called Milo I liked at school started flirting with my sister. And she flirted back! She knew I liked him, but this didn't stop her from agreeing to go on a date with him. She was such a demon! At this point, I couldn't stand her walking around and stealing all the best things I've ever wanted in my life. I had a plan. Back when I was in the orphanage, there was a man who often came to us and said impolitely to the nuns that they should sell him some children to solve their financial worries. Of course, the nuns refused him and kicked him out. He continued to come over a couple of times, and once he gave us his phone number, saying that if any of us got into trouble, we could find him. Then the nun showed up and threatened to call the cops. Well, that was the last time I saw him. I always kept that number because I knew there would be a day I would need it. And that day finally came. I called him and we came up with a plan to solve my Arabelle issue. He sent her an anonymous message telling her to come to a secluded corner in the park to find out some juicy gossip about Milo. Of course, my nosy sister agreed. The man promised my sister would be sent to another place to work to help him earn money, and she wouldn't be harmed. I left a letter at home saying I'd had enough of the poor life and I'd found a better place to go. I told my parents not to be sad and not to look for me. I hid in a corner of the park and waited for my sister to appear. Then, when they took her, I could easily hop into her life and replace her. There would be no more Kirsty anymore, as I would perfectly be back as Arabelle. Well, the better version of her. Suddenly, 
I saw a black car stop in the distance. Two tattooed guys got out of the car. I could see guns in their back. They stopped for a moment to wet a hanky with some liquid thing. This didn't feel right. I knew that this was going way too far. They would hurt my sister, and I was the one who was participating in this sin, and I knew that I would live in guilt for the rest of my life if I ever let it happen. I immediately ran out from where I was hiding, grabbed my sister's hand, and pulled her away. I heard their footsteps right behind us, so I ran as fast as possible to the crowd of people and screamed loudly at the same time to let people around pay attention to us. The other two men probably gave up when we ran into the crowd. After we got back to her home, I told her that I happened to be walking past and overheard the guys saying they were going to kidnap her. Then I just ran to reach her as fast as possible without thinking. She hugged me and thanked me for saving her life. She said that she always thought that I didn't like her, and she used to feel that way about me, too. Wow. That moment she came clear that she used to think that I was just a gross, dirty girl and didn't deserve to be around her, and she from time to time tried to pretend herself in front of me just to make me jealous. She was so sorry for her selfish mind and promised to change her character for me. I also told her that sometimes I became so mean because of envy, but facing this dangerous situation made me realize how much she means to me. And I will not let jealousy blind me anymore. Turns out, living a great life was that simple. We just need to talk straight and openly with each other to solve the problems between us. As for my parents, they read the letter I left them and got upset. We had a good talk and I realized I was being the ungrateful one. Yes, so they didn't have as much money as Arabelle's family did, but they were good people who cared about me. Arabelle hadn't been the only selfish one. I'd been selfish too. Life's good, and Arabelle and I are getting on better than ever. Still, the guilt from what I planned eats me up. Should I come clean about what really happened, or should I keep it a secret and carry on like normal? I mean, it's not like anyone was hurt, right?